Web3 has the potential to change the internet as we know it forever. You're still early in catching the trend right now and building your first blockchain application. Hi there, and welcome to a project video where you'll build and deploy a Web3 crowdfunding platform. And let me tell you, I haven't been this excited about a project for a long time. With a stunning design connected to the blockchain, MetaMask pairing, interaction with smart contracts, sending Ethereum through the blockchain network, writing Solidity code, and most importantly, the ability to create, view, and donate to crowdfunding campaigns directly through the blockchain. This video is perfect to fully understand how Web3, blockchain, Solidity, and smart contracts truly work behind the scenes. On top of learning the Web3 side of things, I'll also teach you how to create a fantastic user interface using Tailwind and follow the best UI UX practices for responsive design. There are many tutorials out there that are hard to understand. They jump between many technologies and are almost impossible to follow. Today, you'll learn how to develop a professional and fully functional crowdfunding application using the most in-demand technologies and even deploy to the internet so you can share it with your friends, employers, and put it on your portfolio. You might be wondering, what are the prerequisites for building such a fantastic website? Don't worry, this course is entirely beginner-friendly. Besides a little React.js knowledge, no Web3, blockchain, or Solidity knowledge is required. Think of this as your first real blockchain application. We're going to start easy and then move to more complex topics. I will explain every step of the way. In this video, you'll learn how to connect a regular React.js application to the blockchain and pair it to your Ethereum wallet using MetaMask. You'll also learn how to write smart contracts on the Ethereum network using the Solidity programming language. Essentially, in this single video, you'll learn how to create a full-fledged Web 3.0 application that allows users to send transactions through the blockchain. Each transaction will belong to a specific crowdfunding campaign and it will be forever stored on the blockchain. And all of this is made possible by ThirdWeb. ThirdWeb is a Web3 development framework that allows you to create, release, or deploy your smart contracts with a single command. They are free, open source, and from a personal experience, their main benefit is simplicity. As Web3 is relatively new, the developer experience in most cases just isn't good, and ThirdWeb fixes that. Today, I'll teach you how to write a smart contract and deploy to the blockchain with a single command using ThirdWeb. In just a couple of seconds, you'll be able to explore your smart contract inside of ThirdWeb's intuitive dashboard. You can see all of your write and read commands, code examples, and you can even copy the deployed smart contract address directly from the dashboard. I'm fascinated with the developer experience ThirdWeb provides, and I hope you'll start sharing that same enthusiasm that I have by the end of this video. If this video reaches 20,000 likes, I'm recording more Web3 dApp videos, so smash that like button. With that said, there's just one more important announcement I want to share with you before we dive into the project. Since this is a Web3 heavy project-based video, I've also prepared for you two entirely free Web3 resources. One is a comprehensive Web3 roadmap, and the other is a Solidity cheat sheet. The link to download these resources entirely for free is in the description. With that said, let's dive right into today's video. Before we begin, please allow me to give you a quick demo of the application that you'll build so you have a better idea of all the great functionalities. You'll build a crowdfunding platform to help bring creative projects to life. People can decide to build a car from scratch, save nature, build a hope village, or a restaurant business. 
and then other people can fund these campaigns in cryptocurrency to support the project. Currently, we're looking at the homepage where you can see all campaigns. You can click on Create a Campaign button to start creating your own campaign. Once you create it, you can click on your profile icon to see all your active campaigns. Finally, if you want to see more campaign details, you can click on a specific campaign. Here, you can see the number of days left until the end of the campaign, the currently raised amount, and the number of people that supported the campaign. A bit below, you can see the creator that created the campaign, a story behind the project, and a list of donators. Most importantly, you have a fund field where you can enter the amount of ETH that you would like to contribute to the cause. And as soon as you click the fund button, a MetaMask notification will appear and you can make your contribution. With that said, let's dive straight into the development of our great application. We can start from the bare beginnings by creating a new empty folder on our desktop. Let's call it crowd funding. It only makes sense, right? Once you create it, simply drag and drop it into your empty Visual Studio Code window. Visual Studio Code is the most popular and most widely used editor out there. Once you open up your empty folder, we can immediately dive into creating the file and folder structure of our application. We're technically building a full stack Web3 application, which means that we're gonna have two different sides of our application. The first side is going to be the client side, where our React code will reside. And then we're gonna also have our Web3 side of things. So to initialize our blockchain environment, we can go to view and then terminal. Inside of here, we can run a simple command, mpx third web at latest create dash dash contract. This is going to start a command line interface that's going to ask us questions and then it's going to set up the environment for us. In here, we have to choose the name of our project. So let's simply say Web3. Then we can press enter to choose hard hat. And then we can choose the name of our smart contract. In this case, it's going to be crowd funding. And we want to start with a completely empty contract because as you know, here in JavaScript Mastery, I always teach you how to do everything from scratch so you can do things by yourself. So let's press enter. While the packages are being installed, let me quickly share with you a new third web platform called Explore. It's a place where you can discover and deploy smart contracts from the best Web3 developers out there. This effectively expands your capabilities as a developer and gives you access to the full power of Web3. Once you find a smart contract that you wanna work on and that fits your needs, you can deploy it to any blockchain with just one click and Third Web will automatically generate an SDK for you to interact with your contract from within the application. And they will also generate an intuitive dashboard for you to manage your smart contract. It is as easy as opening the contract and clicking deploy now. Third Web Explore is an amazing platform for every Web3 developer. There we go. Inside of our directory, now we can run several commands. We can run build, deploy, and release. We're gonna explore these later on. For now, let's simply CD into Web3 and let's clear our terminal. Now we can start exploring what do we have inside of there. You can see that we have a contracts folder with our smart contract. And then we also have a hardhat.config.js. Finally, we have our package.json where we can see the scripts for those commands and our dev dependencies. We want to make our app as secure as possible, which means that we're gonna use environment variables. So we can simply run npm install and we're gonna install a simple package called .env. This took just a second and we can instantly see it appear right here. This means that we are ready to start developing our smart contract. So let's go into the contract.sol file, meaning a Solidity file, and let's rename it to crowdfunding.sol. We can also rename our contract to crowdfunding. There we go. And believe it or not, 
This early in the video, we're actually diving right into code. I'm gonna teach you how to build this smart contract from scratch. So to get started, we're first going to create something known as a struct. Think of it as an object in JavaScript. We can give it a name. In this case, it's going to be called a campaign, a crowdfunding campaign. Inside of there, we can specify the types that this campaign object will have. It's going to have an address, and that address is going to be called owner. It's also going to have a title, but we have to specify a type of the title. So we can say string title. Solidity is a strictly type language, meaning that you have to specify a type for each specific property. Then we're gonna have a string of description. We're gonna also have a uint256, which simply means a number that's going to be called a target, the target amount we want to achieve. We're gonna also have a uint256 for the deadline. We're also gonna have a uint256 for the amount collected. Finally, we're gonna have a string for image. The reason why our image is a string is because we're gonna put a URL of the image right here. Finally, we can have an address, but it's going to be an array of addresses of donators. And we also want to keep track, so uint256, but again, an array of the actual number amounts of our donations. There we go. And this is all that we need to create our campaign. Now in Solidity, there is something known as a mapping. So we have to say mapping, uint256, and then an arrow, meaning equal sign and then greater than sign, that's going to point to a campaign. And we're going to denote that as a public campaigns. Essentially, in here, we created a mapping that now we can use campaigns zero. This is something that we can natively use in JavaScript, but in Solidity, you have to create a mapping to be able to access it this way. Finally, we're going to create a global variable, uint256, public, number of campaigns. And at the start, it's going to be set to zero. We want to be able to keep track of the number of campaigns we have created to be able to give them IDs. Finally, we can dive straight into the functionality of our program. We can first create the structure of all of the functions our smart contract will have. That's going to be function, create, campaign. We need to have a way for us to create a campaign, right? Then we're going to have another one, function donate to campaign. There we go, looks like this. Our third function is going to be function get donators. This is going to give us a list of all the people that donated to a campaign. And finally, we can have a function to get a list of all campaigns. We're gonna call it get campaigns. There we go. We have a structure and we have a mapping, a public variable, and finally four different functions that are gonna contain the entirety of all the logic of our smart contract. So with that said, let's start with the development of our first create campaign function. To start creating our create campaign function, we can first specify what parameters is it going to take in. So we're going to take in the address, which is going to be the owner. But just to know that this is a parameter only for this specific function, we're going to give all parameters an underscore before. So that's going to be the address of the owner. Then we're going to have a string memory equal to underscore title like this. That's going to be the second parameter. Then we can dive into our third one, string memory underscore description. We're also going to have a uint256 underscore target. Another one, uint256 underscore deadline. String memory underscore image. You can notice that we need this memory keyword with every single string. And these are all the parameters that we need. As you can see, it's mostly what we already defined right here needed to create a campaign. Now in Solidity, you have to specify if this function is only internal or if we can use it from our front end. So since this one will be public, we can add a public keyword right here. 
And then we even have to specify what is it going to return. So we can say returns inside of parentheses uint 256. Once we create a campaign, we want to return the ID of that specific campaign. You can see this might be a lot of code, but it's actually going to save us a lot in the future because we have specific rules on what needs to happen. We need to accept all of these parameters and then return a number. With that said, let's create a new campaign by saying campaign storage campaign is equal to campaigns and then the number of campaigns. As you can see, at the start, it's going to be zero, which means that we'll be populating the first element in our campaigns array. Later on, we're going to increment that number. So that's going to be the way in which we're going to fill up our campaigns array. After that, we're going to put a require statement. And a require statement in Solidity is like a check. It is a test to see if everything is good. So let's write here, is everything OK? So inside of here, we can write campaign dot deadline is lower than block dot timestamp. That's going to be the current time. And then if that is the case, if the date of the deadline is before, meaning in the past, then we can provide an error message saying something like the deadline should be a date in the future. There we go. Now our code is not going to proceed further if this is not satisfied. But now if we are okay with that, then we can say campaign dot owner is equal to underscore owner. We can also say campaign dot title is equal to underscore title. Notice how we started filling up our campaign. We can say campaign dot description is equal to underscore description. Campaign dot target is equal to underscore target. Campaign dot deadline is equal to underscore deadline. Campaign dot amount collected is equal to zero at the start. And campaign dot image is equal to underscore image. Finally, once we set that up, we can increment the number of campaigns. So that's simply going to be number of campaigns plus plus. And then finally, if everything went right, we can return number of campaigns minus one. This is going to be the index of the most newly created campaign. Great. Now, in this case, it looks like we have a warning saying that the member deadline is not found or not visible after argument dependent lookup in the struct crowdfunding. So let's go here to the struct and it looks like we have an error. This right here was supposed to be deadline. Great. And also for the blog.timestamp, it looks like I misspelled it. So that's going to be time stamp. This is what I liked about statically typed languages. They save you in so many cases, which is exactly why TypeScript became so much more popular. Great. With that said, our first function create campaign is now done. So we can click right here to collapse it and we can move to our second function, donate to campaign. Our donate to campaign is going to be a bit simpler, at least when it comes to the parameters it takes in. It's going to take just one single parameter, uint256, that's going to be called underscore ID. We need to get the ID of the campaign we want to donate the money to. And it's going to be public and it's going to be payable. This is a special keyword that signifies that we're going to send some cryptocurrency throughout this function. Instead of here, we can create a new variable, uint256 called amount, and we're going to set it equal to message msg.value. This is what we're trying to send from our front end. We're then going to get the campaign we want to donate to. That's going to be campaign storage campaign equal to campaigns. And then like in JavaScript, we put the square brackets and then the underscore ID to access it. Keep in mind, this campaigns right here is the mapping we created at the top. Now that we have our campaign we want to donate to, we can say campaign dot donators dot push msg dot sender. 
So we want to push the address of the person that donated. And we also want to say campaigns.donations.push and we want to push the amount. Let's fix this little error right here. That's supposed to be campaign. And finally, let's make the transaction. Inside of parentheses, we can say bool sent. This is going to be a variable that's going to let us know if the transaction has been sent or not. It's equal to payable campaign dot owner. We're sending it to the owner of the campaign dot call. And then in curly braces, value is going to be equal to amount. And then we can call it like this. That's going to be parentheses. And then inside of there, simply an empty string. Finally, at the bottom, we can say if sent campaign dot amount collected is equal to campaign dot amount collected. And we're going to increment the amount that just came in. Great. It looks like we have a warning right here, different number of components on the left side than on the right side. This is because payable returns two different things. And right now we're accessing just one. So we have to add a comma to let Solidity know that something else might come afterward as well. And with that said, our second function is done as well. We can now create campaigns and we can donate to campaigns. But what good would that be for if we cannot fetch the donators to see who donated on a specific campaign and also we cannot yet fetch the campaigns. So let's get started with the get donators function. Our get donators function is going to be similar to the donate to campaign function, at least when it comes to the parameters it takes in. To be able to get donators, we need to know of which campaign do we want to get the donators from. So we also need to pass in the uint 256 underscore ID. In this case, this is going to be a view function, meaning it's only going to return some data to be able to view it. It's also going to be a public function and it's going to return this time an address rather an array of addresses in memory. So something that we stored before and the second parameter it's going to return is going to be an array of numbers also stored in memory. You already know what this is. In this case, this is the array of addresses of donators and then the array of the numbers of donations. Great. So how will that look like? Well, you simply type return inside of parentheses, campaigns, square brackets, underscore ID, dot donators, and then comma, campaigns, ID, dot donations. Make sure to put the underscore ID right here. And that's going to be it. We simply return something from our campaigns mapping. And with that said, we are ready to move to our last function, which is the get campaigns function. This function takes no parameters because we want to return all campaigns. It's going to be a public view returns. And what do we want to return from this one? Well, I think you can guess it. We want to return an array of campaigns. So that looks like this. And we're going to get them from memory. Instead of here, we need to get all campaigns. So we can say campaign array in memory all campaigns is equal to new campaign array. And then inside of parentheses, number of campaigns. Now let's quickly fix this return to returns to the top. And let's go over by explaining what this is. You can see this part of syntax was a bit weird. I'm not gonna lie. So what we're doing is we're creating a new variable called all campaigns which is of a type array of multiple campaign structures. So in this case, we're not actually getting the campaigns. Rather, we're just creating an empty array with as many empty elements as there are actual campaigns. That's why we have this variable number of campaigns at the top. So for now, we simply have an empty array of that many empty structs as we have actual campaigns created. Now is our time to loop through all of the campaigns and populate that variable. So we can say for u and i is equal to zero, while i is less than number of campaigns, i plus plus. Then we want to get a campaign 
from storage and let's call it item. And we're going to simply populate that to the campaigns I. Finally, we can set the all campaigns I to be equal to that item. In this case, we're fetching that specific campaign from storage and we're populating it straight to our all campaigns. Finally, the only thing we have to do is return all campaigns. Now the function is not going to complain as it is returning exactly what we specified right here. And believe it or not, with that said, we are done with our smart contract. This one took about 70 lines, but trust me, while I was developing it, the original version of the smart contract contained about 150 lines. It is just with a bit of refactoring and making sure that we only have what is needed for our application to work that I was able to bring it down to 70. With that said, hopefully now everything makes sense and we are ready to deploy this smart contract so that we can use it on the front end. Usually, the deployment is the toughest part of Web3 development. Everything is so slow, nothing works, you have to use a lot of additional tools, websites, and programs to be able to deploy your smart contract to the web. But Third Web has covered every single part from development to deployment. So now we can close our Solidity contract and we can go to our folder and we can look into our hardhat.config.js. We just have to ensure we have a couple of lines of code here so that we can properly deploy our contract. Before all, we have to have our own MetaMask wallet. To download MetaMask, which is currently the most widely used crypto wallet, simply go to metamask.io and click the download button. That's going to redirect you to the Chrome Web Store and click Add to Chrome. After you do that, this cute fox is going to appear and you're ready to start with installation. So let's click Get Started. Let's click I Agree. In this case, we're going to create a new wallet and you have to choose a password. Simply type it two times and agree to the terms of use. Finally, I would strongly recommend you to watch this video. It's a one and a half minute video where MetaMask teaches you how to save your private keys. Essentially, in just a moment, you'll be given your secret recovery phrase, which is a set of 12 words that are a password to your account. Now, in my case, I'm going to use my wallet simply for education purposes and no real funds will be stored there. But if in the future you plan to store some real cryptocurrencies there, make sure to write this down and save it securely. With that said, we can click next. In this case, I'm going to share my secret recovery phrase with you by copying these words and clicking next. You can write them down on a piece of paper. Once you do so, I'm going to paste them right here. And now we have to select words in order. So in my case, I have word, area, heavy, envelope, Summer, Intact, Timber, Brown, Trade, Frame, Book, and Second. And we can click Confirm. There we go. Finally, you can see your wallet appear right here. What you have to do is click this Ethereum mainnet, click Show and Hide Test Networks, and then toggle that on. After you do so, you can open up your extensions, and then you can pin MetaMask. That way, it's going to always appear right here. So now if you click right there, you can close this and you can switch from Ethereum mainnet to Gurley test network. Finally, we have to get some funds. So simply copy your account address to clipboard and go to girlyfaucet.com. There you can paste your address and they're going to immediately send you some test Ethereum. Isn't that great? If we now close this, open up our wallet and wait a couple of seconds, you should be able to see your girly ETH appear right in front of you. And there we go. While I was talking, it just popped up. That means that now we have our wallet address and we are ready to go. But we have to get our private key. So go to these three dots, account details and click export private key. Type in your password and then you can copy your private key from here. You can click done, go back to your code, and now we can store that key inside of our environment variables. So simply right click on the Web3 folder and create a new .env file. 
there you can say private underscore key is equal to, and then you can paste your key right here. Inside of our get ignore, make sure that the dot env is there. That means that it won't be pushed to GitHub. Great. That means that now we can use our private key to connect to the Girly network. Back in the browser, just a simple search for Girly RPC immediately takes you to this page where you can get your Girly testnet endpoint. You need this to interact with the blockchain. So you can copy that from here and then back in the code, we can start connecting to our network. Above our settings, we can say default network is going to be set to a string of Girly. Then we can say networks is equal to an object. Inside of there, we can say hard hat and then put it as an empty config. But then we can say Girly is equal to an object where the URL is equal to this RPC we just copied. If you didn't find it on the web, you can simply copy it from me. It's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash RPC dot ANKR.com forward slash ETH underscore girly. And then you can add accounts. That is going to be an array of accounts that starts with a template string of zero X and then process dot ENV dot private underscore key. This is the account which we're going to use to deploy our smart contract. And that's all that we have to do inside of our hard hat config. With that said, we can go to our package.json and run a single command, third web deploy. So right here, we can clear our terminal, make sure that you're in the web three folder and run npm run deploy. This is going to run the MPX third web latest deploy script. There we go, detected project type hard hat. It is immediately compiling it and it even created the artifacts. Finally, it has been processed and it's now uploading contract data straight to their dashboard. And there we go. Upload successful, open this link to deploy your contracts. So let's control click it. And now in the browser, you can now connect your newly created wallet using MetaMask by clicking next and connect. You can see that it picked up that we have 0.5 girly ETH and we want to add it to the dashboard. So make sure that this is ticked and click deploy now. Another MetaMask notification will appear and we can click confirm. Our deployment is now loading. And as you can see, this action will trigger two transactions, which means that we're now waiting for that second transaction while the first one is pending. There we go, a second transaction appeared. If it didn't automatically pop up, simply click right here and then click confirm. Let's wait a couple more moments and our contract will be deployed. And there we go, success, successfully deployed smart contract. And as you can see, we are immediately on this beautiful and intuitive third web dashboard. I think that now you can see what I meant when I said simplicity and everything simply works. This is not something we're used to when developing on Web3 because everything is new and unpolished. But this right here simply looks so polished. You have a graphical user interface and you can see all of the write and read functions that we have created in the smart contract. More importantly, we can go to code and this immediately tells us how we can start using this contract from within our code. Don't worry, I'm gonna teach you how to do all of this. So with that said, the first part of our great application build has been completed. Our smart contract is developed, deployed, and live on the internet with an address right here that we can copy to clipboard and use to connect it to our React application. So let's go ahead and create that React application. To get started, we can get back to our Visual Studio code, cd dot dot to get back to the root and then cd into our client repository. We can close our currently open files and we can run mpx third web create dash dash app and press enter. We need to install the following packages. So press Y and then enter. Now the CLI is asking us what is our project name. I'm just going to type dot slash to create it in the current repository. 
We can use Next.js, Create React App, or even Vite. So let's go for Vite. We can create a Next.js app, a Create React app, or even a Vite app. So let's go with Vite. We're going to do it in JavaScript. And that's it. Our React application is getting initialized. You can pause this video, wait until your installation is complete, and then you can continue. And there we go. Our application has been initialized. Now we can go into the package.json to see the commands and scripts and dependencies that have been installed. As you can see, we can run our application by running npm run dev, which is going to run the vite command. And also we have third web dev react, third web dev SDK, the ethers package, and finally react and react dom. Now in this case, we're gonna need just one more package, which is react router dom to enable routing. So let's open up the terminal one more time and let's just type npm install react-router-dom. That installed in just a second and we are ready to run npm run dev to see what's gonna happen. Our application is up and running and we can control click this URL. And there we go. In just a couple of seconds, we can see welcome to third web. Get started by configuring your desired network in source main.jsx. Great. We can also immediately connect our wallet, which is a really handy feature that third web provides out of the box. With that said, we're going to do things just a bit differently. You're here watching this video right now, and you want to know how can you build this? from scratch without all of these styles, app.js, main.js, and so on. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to delete the entire source folder, and then we're going to create it from scratch by creating a new SRC folder inside of the client folder. There, we're gonna create a new index.js file. That is the starting point of every single React application. To get started, we can import React from React. We can also import React DOM from React DOM forward slash client. We can also import browser router as router coming from React router DOM. Let's spell that properly. And finally, we can import chain ID as well as third web provider coming from at thirdweb-dev forward slash react. Then we can create our react root by saying const root is equal to react dom dot create root document dot get element by ID root. And then finally, we can say root dot render. And there we can pass the third web provider. That's going to be a wrapper for our entire application. There, we have to pass a desired chain ID, which is going to be a chain ID dot girly. If you control click into this, you can see that this is nothing more than a number five, but it's really handy that third web provides us this great utility called chain ID to immediately just put it like this and not just put five as a magic number, which is not a good practice in coding. Finally, we can wrap everything with a router as well. And inside of there, we can have our app. So of course, let's go ahead and create that app inside of the source. That's going to be app.js. Inside of our app for now, we can simply run RAFCE. RAFCE is a command coming from snippets, one of the extensions right here, ES7 plus React Redux React Native Snippets. So install that, run RAFCE, and it's going to immediately generate this code. This is all that we need in here so far, and we can import that app inside of our index. Simply by saying import app from dot slash app. And finally, we are rendering it right here. Now, if we go back to our app, we can see that it simply says app. So if we go back and reload, but we cannot seem to see anything here back in our code, Switching the main to main.jsx and app.jsx as well might make things work. 
If I'm not mistaken, we had that JSX there before we deleted the source folder in the first place. So now if we go back, we can see the app keyword right on the top left of our browser. That means that we have successfully set up the most basic structure of our application. Now, I almost forgot, we also have to add Tailwind to our application, as we'll use it to simplify the process of writing our CSS. The process of installing Tailwind with Vite is quite simple. You can go to tailwindcss.com forward slash docs forward slash guides forward slash Vite. And then right here, we can copy this command npm install dash d tailwind css post css and auto prefixer so back in our code we can open up our terminal stop it from running and then we can run this command great that was completed in nine seconds and now we can copy the second command mpx tailwind css init dash p this is going to create a tailwind.config file Back here, we can configure our template paths by copying the content part of our Tailwind config. So we can override an empty content part right here. Finally, we have to add the Tailwind directives to our CSS. So let's copy these three lines and we're going to add them in a new file that we're going to create inside of the source folder called index.css. There, you can paste those three lines. As a matter of fact, down below in the description, you can find the entire index.css file for this application, and you can copy and paste it. As you can see, the finished file is nothing more than those three lines, but we also created some linear gradients so we can utilize them later on, as well as imported the font. Great, that's going to be it for our Tailwind installation. Now we can set up the rest of the file and folder structure for our React application. Down in the description as well, you can find a link to the assets folder. Simply download it and then paste it right here. Inside of there, you can find a lot of different loaders, logos, SVGs, different icons, and everything exported from a single file. I wanted to ensure that you have everything needed to focus on what matters which is coding the logic of our application. Then we can create a new folder called constants. Inside of there, you can create a new index.js file. This file can also be found in the GitHub just down below. You can copy and paste it right here. This file contains no logic, simply some navigation links, which we can map over later on with the image URLs included. Then we can create a new folder called context. This one is important. Inside of here, we're going to create a React context API that's going to allow us to use the third web logic from within our entire application. Then we're going to need the components folder. We're going to also need the pages folder. And finally, we're going to need the utils folder. Inside of the utils folder, we're going to have one file called index.js. Utils is short for utility functions, some functions that we reuse often across our page. This file is also going to be down in the description. In here, we mostly have some simple logic, such as calculating the days left from the date, calculating the bar percentage, depending on how much money was donated, and finally checking if the image is all right, the URL of the image that we add to our campaign. As you can see, nothing major, just about 20 lines of code. With that said, now we have everything we need to start developing our great application. And of course, everything is going to start from app.jsx. From within here, we're gonna create our basic application layout. To get started creating our layout, we can import React from React. We can also import the route and routes coming from React dash router dash dom then we can create our wrapper div this div is going to have a class name equal to relative on small devices padding dash eight meaning p dash eight usually p dash four bg dash inside of square brackets we can put hash one three one three one a it's going to have a min-h-screen property 
for 100 VH, and it's going to be flex and flex row. Now, if you are unaware of what these properties are doing, these are Tailwind utility classes. So you can go to Tailwind CSS, go to Docs, and then use this quick search to search any single property you're interested in. For example, we use the min-h-screen. And you can see that this is going to be for minimum height. You can also go to spacing and then padding and see that we can use P, X, P, Y, or other utility classes to specify padding. Essentially, everything you can do with regular CSS, you can do with Tailwind, shorter, and more quickly. So, while watching this video, if you're unaware of what some of these classes do, such as Flex or Flex Row, simply go to Tailwind CSS Docs and then search for them right here, and you'll get a detailed explanation. With that said, we can go back, and now might be a good time to put our browser side by side by our editor so we can see the changes we make live. And there we go. My browser is on the right side now. And let's try typing app inside of here. If you save the file and reload the application, we should, of course, get an error because we forgot to rerun our application. Trust me, it happens. So let's simply run npm run dev to rerun it on the same port. Immediately, you can reload and we can see app right here. With that said, let's continue creating the layout of our application by creating an inner div, which is going to be a wrapper for our sidebar. So let's give it a class name. On small devices, flex, usually hidden, margin right of 10, and then relative. Inside of here, we're going to have our sidebar component. Now, below that, we're going to have a new div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to flex-1. On max-sm devices, we're going to have a w-full, meaning with full. And then usually max-w is going to be 1,280 pixels. Margin X is going to be set to auto, and then on small devices, padding right is going to be set to 5. Inside of here, we can show our navbar component. Now, it seems to me that these classes are not being applied. So maybe our V configuration is not properly reading our Tailwind config. So if we go to our tailwind.config.js, we can verify that our content is all right. And also, from within down in the description, you'll be able to find a theme setting. So right here, you can override that theme and that's going to give us access to this special epilogue font and the box shadow we're going to use later on. But that's not going to fix our issue with Tailwind. So before we dive into further debugging, let's do a test to see if Tailwind is really not working. Let's create an H1 and let's say test. We can see it right here. And if we give it a class name, and if we transform it to just a regular P, you can see it became smaller. But now if we give it a class name of font-xl and also font-bold, it should become extra large and bolded, but it remains the same, which means that these styles indeed are not working. And I just remembered we forgot to import the actual index.css file within our index.js file. So below the app, simply say import dot slash index.css. And there we go. Immediately, you can see that the background change to dark, which means that Tailwind is working. Great. Now we have our sidebar, we have our navbar, but we have to specify the routes. So below the navbar, we can say routes, and we can specify each individual page that we're going to have on our application. In new React Router DOM, you have to say path forward slash to specify the root route and then say element. In this case, it's going to be a home component. Of course, we're going to get an error because we haven't yet created this home page. We also don't have the navbar or the sidebar pages. So now might be the best time to create all of the files, all of the pages and components 
so that we can simply import them whenever we need them. Let's start with pages. We can create a new file called home.jsx and there you can run RAFCE inside of it. Then you can create another one called profile.jsx and again run RAFCE inside of it. Finally, there are two more pages, campaign details.jsx, you can run RAFCE. And the last one is create campaign.jsx, where you can also run RAFCE. With that said, the last missing piece of the puzzle is an index.js file that's going to export all of these components. So let's say export default as home from dot slash home like this. And now we can duplicate this three more times. The second time we want to export the profile. The third time we want to export the create campaign. And finally, we want to export the campaign details. Now, if we close all of those files, go back in the app, we can now freely import those pages. So let's say import campaign details, create campaign, home and profile, all coming from dot slash pages. And the error is gone. And we can see a piece of text that says home, which is exactly what we want to see because that's the only thing that the home component currently has. Great. Now we can also repeat the procedure by creating two new components, one called sidebar.jsx. We can again run RAFCE and the last one called sidebar.jsx and another one called navbar.jsx where we can also run RAFCE. Remember, we also need to export them. So let's say index.js from within we can say export default as sidebar from dot slash sidebar. And we can repeat that for the navbar. Now back inside of our app, above the pages, we can import sidebar and navbar from dot slash components. And we can turn these two pieces of text into actual usable components. Of course, we have to close it right here. There we go. We have the navbar, we have the home. And just to verify, we can change something in the navbar to see if the changes are reflected and they indeed are. With that said, our basic structure is now done and we can start focusing on the sidebar, navbar and our home page component. Sidebar and navbar are the simplest possible components, but they usually take the most time because you have to make them responsive. You have to have that hamburger menu on the mobile and everything has to look great. But we immediately want to see something on the screen. Let's start by creating the sidebar component first so we can control click into it and we can start developing it. To start developing our sidebar, we can first import react as well as use state coming from react. Then we can also import the link component as well as the use navigate coming from react router dom. Finally, we can import the logo as well as the sun icons coming from dot slash assets. And finally, we can import the nav links coming from dot, dot slash constants. This is all a part of the code that we provided for you before starting with this video. Again, mostly assets and some constants. Great. With that said, we can start developing our navbar. First, we can initialize the const navigate is equal to use navigate and we call that as a hook. That's going to allow us to traverse the different pages later on. And we can immediately create a new use state field by typing use state, selecting the snippet, and let's call it is active, set is active. And at the start, the dashboard field is going to be set to active. 
Just to show you what we are building, I opened up our finished version of the application. And as you can see, we're going to have this logo on top left, which might be a part of the nav bar. But then when it comes to the sidebar, we're going to have all of these icons and links that we'll be able to click. So let's continue developing it. First, we're going to have a div that's going to wrap our entire sidebar. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex, justify dash between, items dash center, flex dash call, sticky, top dash five, and then h dash 93 vh. Immediately inside of there, we can create a new link. This is going to be a link component that's going to have a two property going to forward slash, meaning home. And inside of there, we can render a new icon component. This icon component is going to be used just here within the sidebar, so we can immediately create it right here by saying const icon, and that's going to be a basic React functional component. It's going to have an instant return, so we can simply put parentheses right here. It's going to be a div, and before we start adding anything to it, we need to know what props can we pass to that icon. So if we go right here, we're gonna pass some styles. For example, W-52 pixels and H-52 pixels as well. We can also give it a BG-hash-2C2F32. And finally, we can give it an IMG URL which is going to be set to logo. Later on, we're gonna also pass the is active state to our icon so we know should we highlight it or not. With that said, we can now accept those props at the top. So let's accept the styles, the name, IMG URL, is active, disabled, and handle click. All of these are properties that we're gonna later on pass to our icon component. Now we can start focusing on the class name. So let's do class name is going to be a template string where W is going to be set to 48 BX. H is going to be set to 48 BX as well for the height. Rounded dash 10 pixels. And now we have to know is it active or not. And we can say is active and end is active is triple equal to name and then we want to show the bg dash hash 2c 2f 32 and we can close the string there we go so now if we are active we're going to give this special background color which we can see right here around this icon there perfect moving on it's also going to have a property of flex justify dash center items dash center and also dynamic string of if not disabled, then cursor dash pointer like this. And finally, we want to also give it all the styles that we pass later on through props. For example, right here. Now, if we save this, nothing's gonna happen because we have nothing inside of that div. So let's say like this, if not is active, then we want to show something that looks like this, a self-closing image tag. That image tag is going to have a source equal to IMG URL. It's going to have an alt tag equal to fund underscore logo. And it's going to have a class name equal to W-1 over 2 and H-1 over 2 as well. That's going to be it for our image. Now we can copy it and we can create the OR clause right here below. Finally, to this one, we're gonna give some additional class names. So let's make this dynamic, a template string, there we go. And then we can say dollar sign curly braces. If is active is not equal to name, then we can give it a gray scale color. There we go. So now if we save this, we cannot seem to see anything yet. I think that's because the sidebar is not showing on this screen. But if we extend it just a bit, you can see it is there. So right now we're working on the desktop version of the sidebar, which means that we do have to have some width. That's fine. So we can collapse our Visual Studio code, but then it's going to be hard to code that way 
So let's keep the Visual Studio code right here, but then we can click to see what we have done. Great. And also we have to provide an on click to our div. And that on click is going to be handle click. Now we have created this special icon component that we can reuse later down the line. Below our link, we want to create something that looks like this, where we're going to have a sidebar. So if we go back, we can go below our link and create a div component. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex dash one flex flex dash call for the elements to appear in a column justify dash between items dash center bg dash hash 1c 1c 24 rounded dash 20 pixels and w dash 76 pixels padding y py 4 and then mt 12 for margin top inside of which we're going to map over all the links so this div is going to have a class name equal to flex flex dash call justify dash center items dash center and gap dash three inside of there we can finally create a dynamic block of code and say nav links dot map we're going to get each individual link and we want to have an instant return meaning simply parentheses. We want to render a self-closing icon component. Since we're mapping over it, we need to give it a key equal to link.name. And we're going to also spread all of the link properties like this. We can also pass the is active state and we need to pass the handle click. Handle click in this case is going to be a callback function where we have to check if not link dot disabled only then do we want to set is active link dot name and we also want to navigate to link dot link there we go all of this is inside of the nav links you can see each link has a link and then we also have disabled on some of the links because we can only move between the first few great and if we now go back to our browser you can see our beautiful sidebar appear right here. We are a bit too much zoomed in, so I just figured out that we might be able to see it right here as well if we just zoom out to the normal width. Great, so now we have our beautiful sidebar and it is looking close to this one, but as you can see, there's one icon on the bottom of the finished application. So let's finalize that. Below this inner div, we can create one more icon. That's going to be a self-closing icon that's going to have styles equal to bg dash one hash one c one c two four and a shadow dash secondary finally it's going to have an img url equal to sun if we save this you can see this appear right here and there we go you can see that some icons you can hover over and then it means you're clickable and they actually change the page, which is perfect. And the other ones you cannot click on. So in this case, we have the dashboard, we have the create a campaign, and we have our profile. Perfect. With that said, we not only have the sidebar, but we also have the navigation of our application done. Because as you can see, we're in the home. If we switch, we cannot see that home anymore. And we cannot see the profile. Great. With that said, we can close our sidebar and we can move to our navbar, the only other component that's going to be visible across all pages. So let's control click the navbar and let's start developing it. To start developing our navbar, we can also import use state coming from React and then we can import the same link and use navigate components coming from react-router-dom because navbar will also be used to traverse our application. With that said, we will need one custom component and that's going to be a custom button. So let's create a new component called custom button.jsx. Inside of there, we can create RAFCE and for now we can let it be, but let's not forget to export it. So inside of the index.js, you can export the custom button. There we go. 
So now inside of our nav bar, we can say import custom button, and that's gonna be coming from dot slash as we are already inside of components. Then we can import the logo, menu, search, and third web icons coming from dot dot slash assets. And finally, we can import nav links coming from dot dot slash constants. Great. Now inside of the nav bar, we can initialize our navigate function by calling the use navigate hook. And inside of here, we're going to also have that same is active state. So let's create a new state. Let's set it to is active, set is active. And at the start, it's going to be set to dashboard. We're going to have another one called toggle drawer. So let's create a new use state. And let's call it toggle drawer. And at the start, it's going to be set to false. There we go. Now we can immediately dive into the layout of our nav bar. Just to remind you, this is how it looks like. It has a search page, it has a connect button, and a profile icon logo. Great. So we're going to have a wrapper div that's going to have a class name equal to flex. On medium devices, flex dash row, usually flex dash call dash reverse. This ensures that on mobile devices, we show the connect on top. If we do it like this, you can see we have this drawer. If we open it, then we have the connect and all of the other properties. There we go. And if we go back, this is looking great. Finally, let's give it a justify dash between property. Margin bottom of 35 pixels to divide it a bit from the content and gap dash six to divide the elements. Of course, we cannot see anything there yet. Now inside of this div, we're going to have one more div. This div is going to have a class name equal to on large devices, flex dash one, usually flex dash row. And we want to give it a max dash W dash 458 pixels. This is for the maximum width of the nav bar. We can give it a padding Y, meaning padding on top and bottom two and padding left four and also padding right two to divide it a bit from the content. Height of the nav bar can be 52 pixels. So we can specify that right here. And then the background can be hash 1C1C24. Now, if we save this, you can see this small rectangle appear right here, but no content as of yet. Now inside of there, we can create a wrapper for the search. So let's give it a class name equal to W dash 72 pixels, H dash full rounded dash 20 pixels, BG dash, that's going to be hash 4A CD 8D flex justify dash center items dash center and cursor dash pointer we're creating this button that's going to appear right here. And inside of that div, we can show the self closing image tag, that's going to have a source equal to search, alt is going to be set to search as well. And finally, the class name is going to be like this, w 15 pixels, h 15 pixels for the height, and object dash contain. If we save that, you can see this button appear right here. Now above that div that contains this image, we can also create an input tag. That's going to be a self closing input of a type is equal to text. It's going to have a placeholder equal to search for campaigns. There we go. It's ugly now. But if we give it a class name of flex, w dash full font dash epilogue font dash normal text dash 14 pixels placeholder colon text dash hash 4b5264 for the color text dash white bg dash transparent 
and outline dash none and press save, you can see that now it's looking much closer to this one right here. But it still doesn't seem to be rounded. So to this div outside after the background color, we can give it a property rounded dash 100 pixels. And if we do that and go back, you can see that this is looking great now. Now we can go below this div containing the image and below one more div and then create another div for our button that's going to appear on the right side. We can give that div a class name equal to on small devices flex hidden flex dash row justify dash end and gap dash four. The small flex means that this is only going to be visible on small devices and usually it's going to be hidden. Inside of there, we can render that custom button component that we have created. It's going to be a self-closing component to which we can pass the button type equal to button, as later on we're gonna have the anchor type buttons. We can also pass it a title. And that title is going to depend on if we currently have an active address or not. So for now, we can only hard code that address right here. Cost address, is equal to 0x and then something. So we can simply put it here. Now we can say title. If there is an address, then the title is create a campaign because we have a connected wallet. Otherwise, it's going to be simply connect. There we go. Let's also expand our code just a bit more to have more space. And let's see if the sidebar is going to still be visible and it will. Great. Now we have a custom button, but we can also give it some styles. So we can say styles. If there is an address, then we can give it a BG off hash 1DC071. And then else, we can give it a BG off hash 8C6DFD. There we go. Finally, this button is only going to have one function. And we can define that function by giving it the handle click property, which is going to be a callback function. And that callback function is going to have an if statement. If there is an active address, in that case, we can navigate to create campaign. If there isn't an active address, we can say else, we want to connect the wallet. And we can do that by using the connect function. Right now, you can see that we don't have that function defined, so it's giving me something else. So for now, we can simply put a string right here of connect, and then later on, once we implement this function, we're going to simply remove the string signs. Great. Now, of course, nothing happened here, and we can just see custom button, because we are just sending props, but we now need to go into that component and utilize the props we just sent. So right here, we can now get that BTN type. We can also get the title, the handle click, and the styles. And we can create a new button. That button is going to be a button component. It's going to have a type equal to BTN type. It's going to have a class name equal to a template string. It's going to be dynamic and it's going to render the styles that we sent into it. I forgot to add a comma here. And finally, on click, it's going to simply call the handle click function and it's going to render the title that we sent through it. So now we can see this create a campaign on top right. But it still doesn't look like our button. So let's apply some more class names. Right here, we can start typing classes, such as font-epilogue. If we save that, it already makes it look a bit more custom. Font-semi-bold, that makes it look better. Text-16 pixels, leading-26 pixels. Text-white, min-h-52 pixels, to give it some height. Let's give it some space, px of four, and most importantly, rounded dash 10 pixels to make it look like a real button. There we go. We have our create a campaign button. Now we can go back into the navbar 
and below this custom button, we can create one last final link. This link is going to not be a self-closing component, but it's going to point to forward slash profile. Inside of there, we want to show a div. And inside of that div, we can immediately create a self-closing image tag with a source of third web. That's going to be our static profile picture. There we go. Let's make it just a bit smaller by giving it an alt tag of user and then most importantly, a class name equal to w-60% h-60%. as well and object-contain. And of course, we have to properly end that string. There we go, it's still huge and that's because we haven't defined the proportions of the outside div of that image. So let's give it a class name equal to w-40 pixels. That's already going to make it much smaller. h-40 pixels, rounded-10 pixels, bg-2c-2f32, flex, justify-center, items-center, and cursor-pointer. And with that, we have our real profile icon. Great. Now, of course, this doesn't look that good because we're technically on a tablet or a mobile screen. But if we expand it, you can see that it looks great. Although there seems to be a small inconsistency with this icon right here. You can notice how it is next to this connect button. It doesn't seem to be centered and it doesn't seem to be circled. So let's see why that is the case. We have a div that's wrapping our custom button and also a link to profile. That link is going to have a div and instead of 40 pixels, this was supposed to be 52 for both cases. There we go. And also it doesn't seem to be rounded enough and instead of rounded 10 pixels, it's going to be rounded dash full. There we go. This is looking more like it. Great. Now we can start focusing on the mobile version of our navigation bar. So right below this link and below one more div, we can create a comment saying small screen navigation. There we go. And below that, we can develop it. So let's also convert our browser to something like a tablet or a mobile screen. There we go. You can do that by zooming in and then instantly you'll be able to see just this nav bar. Inside of here, we can create a div and that div is going to have a class name on small devices, hidden, usually flex, justify dash between, items dash center, and relative. Now, still nothing is going to happen, but bear with me. We can give it a div, another one, which is going to be a container for our image. We can give it a class name almost equal to, to the one for this image right here. So let's simply copy this entire div inside of this link and let's paste it instead of the new one we just created. Instead of 52, 52, this time it's going to be 40 and then 40 right here. It's not going to be rounded full. It's going to be rounded 10 pixels. BG can remain the same. Flex justify centered and item center can remain and the cursor pointer. Now, if we save that, we can see it right here. Below that, we want to show our hamburger menu. So let's go below this div right here of the image. And there we can show a self-closing image tag with a source equal to menu, alt tag equal to menu, class name is going to be w-34 pixels, h-34 pixels, object-contain, and cursor-pointer. Finally, we can give it an on-click property that's going to have a callback function. And there we want to set the toggle drawer to not toggle drawer, meaning we want to toggle it on and off. Currently, that's not going to do anything, but we'll make use of that information to show our mobile drawer. So right below that image, we can create a div. This div is going to have a dynamic class name, meaning a template string. 
it's going to be absolute. It's going to be top dash 60 pixels, right dash zero and left dash zero, BG dash hash 1C1C24, a Z index of 10 to appear on top, shadow dash secondary, padding Y four, and then we want to check if not toggle drawer, then we want to translate it. We want to show it. So what we can do is we can say a string of minus translate minus dash Y dash 100 VH like this. Otherwise, we can end that string and say translate dash Y dash zero. We're also going to give it a transition of all and duration of 700 milliseconds. Bear with me, you're going to see how that's going to work really soon. For now, you can just see this appear right there. If you clicked on the toggle drawer, finally, inside of this div, we can create a UL with a class name equal to MB dash four. And there we can map over our nav links. So we can say nav links dot map, we get a link. And then for each link, we return something that's an instant return, meaning simply parentheses here, we're going to return an li. That li is going to have a key equal to link dot name. It's going to have a class name equal to a template string of flex p dash four. Then we will need to check if is active is equal to link dot name. And then we can show the bg of hash 3a 3a 43. And that's going to be it for the class names. But finally, we can give it an on click. That's going to be a callback function where we can set is active to be equal to link dot name, or rather we can call it with a link dot name. Then we want to set the toggle drawer to false to close it. And then finally, we want to use the navigate function to navigate to the link dot link, similar to what we have done on our sidebar. Finally, we need to show our icons. And if I'm not mistaken, we can copy that from our sidebar. Remember, right here for each link, we were showing an icon. And finally, inside of here, we need to show an image that's going to be a self closing image tag with a source equal to link dot IMG URL. If we now save this, you can see this great menu icons appear. Then we have to give it an alt tag. That's going to be equal to link dot name. Then below that image, we can show a P tag. That P tag is going to render the link dot name as well. And there we go. You can see the dashboard campaign payment and so on. Let's style that P tag just a bit by giving it a class name equal to that's going to be a template string. First, we want to give it a margin left to divide it from the left side. So let's do ML 20 pixels. There we go. That's better. Then we want to change the font to epilogue. We can also make it semi bold. We can decrease the size a bit by saying text 14 pixels. And then most importantly, we want to change the color and the color is going to depend on is it currently active or not. So we can say if is active is equal to link dot name, then we can change the color to text dash hash one D C 071. We can close that. And then if that is not the case, we can opt in for more gray regular color by saying text hash eight zero eight zero one nine one. There we go. And we can close it. If we save it, you can see that this one is green now and all the other ones are gray. Perfect. Of course, let's also style the icon a bit by giving a class name to this image. That class name is also going to be dynamic W 24 pixels for the width of the icon. Let's do it properly. And the same thing for the height H 24 pixels. Then we want to set object dash contain. And we want to check if is active is equal to link dot name. 
Then we can have a question mark for the ternary operator and set grayscale to zero. Else we want to turn the grayscale on like this. So now you can see everything is grayed out, but if we switch to campaign or profile, the icon and the text changes to green. Great. But of course, we're still missing a button to create a campaign. Right here, you can see it's there, but if we go to tablet or mobile, it disappears. So we need to reuse that same create custom button component. So let's copy it from here, go down. We're gonna go down below the UL, and there we want to create a div. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex and margin X of four to divide it a bit from the left and the right side. There we can paste our custom button and we can indent it properly. It's going to be of a type button and it's going to say everything the same. We want to keep everything as it is. Now, if we save this, you can see our create a campaign button. And if we compare that with this version of the application, it's looking great as well. We can toggle it on, we can toggle it off, but on our current version, we cannot seem to toggle it off. So if we go to where our hamburger menu icon is right here, set toggle drawer, toggle drawer, that doesn't seem to be working. Let's try to reload the page. And yep, it's still there, but it doesn't want to go away. So in here, if we click that, we indeed are setting it to not toggle drawer. This right here is not the best practice. Whenever you're changing state with the older version of that state, then you have to have a callback function, get the previous state, and then say not previous state. This is a common React best practice, but this is not going to fix our issue right now. The actual issue is that we prematurely closed our brace right here and we're not accounting for the logic later on. So we have to take this one and we can only end it later on, I think about here. So let's try to fix this error. We have if not toggle drawer, then translate Y else right here. And you can notice this, that shouldn't be there. So if we remove that and then close this right here, save it, it goes away. And now we can open it by clicking on the menu icon or we can close it by going to another page. So we can go to profile and we can go back to dashboard and we can also expand our browser and we can now use the sidebar to do the same. So now our sidebar and the navbar are completely done. This part took the most time, but it's good because that's gonna be seen across all of our pages, the dashboard, profile, create campaign and everything else. So with that said, we're done with our sidebar and our navbar. We can now close it and we can go back to our app.js where our first component is our next step. That is going to be the homepage component where we can fetch all of our campaigns. Now, if you think about it, that might be a problem because right now we don't yet have a way for us to create a campaign. So we need to go back to app.js and let's add another route. That route is going to be to create a campaign. So that's a self-closing route with a path equal to forward slash create dash campaign. And then the element is going to be set to a component of create campaign. There we go. And we also need to close it. Now, as you can see, we get an error and we're missing an end because create campaign doesn't yet exist and it breaks. And that's because I'm missing an M right here. There we go. While we're here, we can also add all of the other routes. The third route is going to be the profile route. So let's create a self-closing profile with a path to forward slash profile. The element is going to be a self-closing profile page and we can close it we also need to close the route component itself. So if we do that, we're good to go. And the last component on our list, or rather the last route, is a path to forward slash campaign dash details, and then forward slash colon ID. This is a dynamic route that's going to show the details of every single campaign. So there we can render an element 
and that's going to be a self-closing campaign details component. There we go. Let's fix this and we are good to go if we just add one more character right here. There we go. So just to show this to you, we have four different routes. The home route going to root, the profile route going to the profile component, create campaign going to the create campaign page, and campaign details going to campaign details page. I would love to start working immediately on the home route, but that doesn't really make sense because there's no data to work with. So we need to control click into the create campaign first, create a couple of campaigns, and then we can focus on showing them. But this is good because in the create campaign, we'll actually have to connect with our blockchain, connect with our smart contract, and then create the actual campaigns on the blockchain to be able to fetch them. So this is the first time that we're gonna start creating the actual interaction between our front end and our back end. Everything is just starting to get more exciting. So let's continue. To get started developing our create campaign page, we can start with the imports. We're gonna also have the use state field coming from React. We're gonna have the import use navigate as well one more time. And that's coming from react-router-dom. Now, this is also gonna be the first time where we're gonna import ethers coming from ethers. This is a utility library that's going to allow us to interact with our smart contract. We can then import the money icon coming from dot dot slash assets. And we're gonna also import our custom button component that we created not that long ago. That's coming from dot dot slash components. We're gonna also import the check if image utility function coming from dot dot slash utils. Great. Now we can immediately initialize our const navigate is equal to a use navigate hook call. We can also create our states. In this case, we're going to have two different use states. The first one is going to be a use state snippet called is loading. And at the start, it's going to be set to false. Below that, we're going to have one more use state. And this one is going to be our form, set form, and that's going to be equal to an object at the start. Inside of this form, we're gonna have all the fields needed to create our campaign. It's going to be a name, campaign title, story, goal, end date, and campaign image. So let's do just that. We can provide a name, then a title. We can also do a description. Finally, we're gonna have a target, a deadline, and an image, which is also going to be an empty string at the start. Great. Now we have everything we need to start developing create campaign layout. First, we're gonna have a div, and that div is going to have a class name equal to bg-hash1c1c24, our classic dark color. It's going to be of a type flex, justify center and items dash center. It's going to be of a flex dash call because we want the elements to appear one below another. It's also going to be rounded dash 10 pixels. And on small devices, it's going to have a padding of 10, usually a padding of four. If we save that and go back to our site, we can click create campaign page and you can see this create campaign component. Now, sometimes inside of there, we're gonna have our loading. So we can say, if is loading, then show the string of loader. Later on, we can create this as a real component. For now, we can leave it like this. And below that, we can have one more inner div. And within that div, we're gonna have an H1, where we can say, start a campaign. There we go. Now, of course, it's hard to see it. So let's give this H1 a class name equal to font dash epilogue. Let's also give it a font dash bold. On small devices, text dash 25 pixels to make it large. Usually text dash 18 pixels, leading dash 38 pixels and text dash white. This should be much better. Let's also style the div that's wrapping our H1 by giving it a class name set to flex 
justify dash center, items dash center, padding dash 16 pixels to give it some space. On small devices, min dash w dash 380 pixels to give it some regular width that's always going to be there. Let's also change the background a bit to hash 3a 3a43. There we go. And let's make it rounded dash 10 pixels. There we go. This is looking better. Now below that, we can start adding our form. So we can go below this div wrapping our h1 and we can create our form. This form is going to have an on submit property. And once that happens, we want to call our handle submit function. This is a function that we haven't yet created, but we can define it right here. Const handle submit is going to be a regular function looking like this, which we can fill later on. Our form is also going to have a class name equal to w full margin top 65 pixels flex flex dash call and cap dash 30 pixels. That way, all the inputs are going to appear one below another. Now we can start adding the input fields. Some input fields are going to come together. For example, the name and campaign, they're going to take half the space. So they're going to be in a shared div. And then some are going to take the full width of the screen. So for the ones that are going to take half the screen, we can wrap them in another div like this. And that div is going to have a class name equal to flex flex dash wrap, and then gap dash 40 pixels like this. And now inside of there, we can show those inputs. Now we are not going to hard code every single input because that would be a lot of repeated code. We're going to create a new form field self closing component. So let's do just that by going to components and creating a new form field dot JSX component where we can run RAFCE. And we can also export that component from our index.js by changing the custom button to form field. Of course, before changing it, duplicate it. And now if we go back and reload, inside of the create campaign, we of course have to import it from components. That's going to be form field. And you can see the form field right here. Now we can duplicate it as many times we want, and it's going to appear right here. Now we can pass the right props to this form field. So let's do just that. That's going to be label name equal to your name. And we can put an asterisk, meaning that it is required. We can then add a placeholder set to John Doe. We can change the input type to be text. We can set the value to be form.name and we can add the handle change, which for now can be an empty callback function. And we can duplicate this form field right here. For the second one, we're going to say campaign title right here. The placeholder can be something like write a title and it's going to be form.title. With that said, we can now go into the form field and we can develop this component. That way, both of these fields are going to change immediately and we can then keep reusing this form field component for all of the other fields as well. That's the beauty of React. To get started with developing our form field, we can first get all of the props that we passed into it. That's going to be label name, placeholder, input type, is text area, this is going to be a field that we're going to see later on, value, and then handle change, finally. Great. Now our input, or rather our form field is going to be consisted of a label and an input. So let's start by wrapping everything inside of a label component. That label is going to have a class name equal to flex dash one, w dash full flex and then flex dash call inside of there we can check if there is a label name so that's going to be label name and only if there is then we can show a span element that span is going to render the actual label name now if we save it we can already see your name and campaign title appear right here but let's style it a bit 
let's give that span a class name equal to font dash epilog font dash medium text dash 14 pixels leading dash 22 pixels text dash that's going to be hash eight zero eight one nine one and finally mb for margin bottom of 10 pixels now if we save that you can see this looks much better much closer to the final design finally below that we want to know if this is a text area or an input so inside of the label but below the label name we can make another check is text area if it is we then want to show a text area input that looks like this else right here we want to show of course an input so since we're going to work with inputs first let's focus on that right away our input is going to be required it's going to have a value equal to the value that we pass through props it's going to have an on change equal to handle change that we also pass through props type is equal to input type coming from props and step is going to be set to 0 0.1 that allows you to switch the number of ethereum right here if you click on these arrows great and then finally we can add a placeholder equal to placeholder and a class name now bear with me there's going to be a lot of class names to make this look good padding y dash 15 pixels that's to extend it a bit on small devices px 25 pixels so on smaller devices they're going to take the full width as you can see right here usually padding x is going to be 15 pixels outline is going to be set to none we don't want that ugly outline border is going to be set to one pixel then we have to set the border color so we can say border dash that's going to be hash 3a3a43 then we can set the bg to transparent okay that already looks much better then we can set the font to be epilogue and we can set the text to be white we can also set the text to be 14 pixels there we go now they fit again we can change the placeholder text by saying placeholder colon and then text dash that's going to be hash 4b5264 there we go let's make it rounded a bit rounded dash 10 pixels okay and let's also on small devices give it a min dash w dash 300 pixels for the minimum width there we go this is now our input now our text area is going to be almost exactly the same as our input so let's simply copy all of these properties and let's simply paste them right here we need to have required we have to have the placeholder then the styles in this case we don't need the steps but we do need the rows the number of rows so in this case it's going to be a number of 10. the input type we don't need right here the on change we of course do need and that's about it great now we have created our form field component and we can go back as you can see we didn't have to create each one separately we just reuse the same component two times and we're going to reuse it one two three four more times so going back to our create a campaign page we can go below this div now and we can add one more form field we can do that really easily by just copying the last one and pasting it right here instead of campaign title we're going to put a story right here and say write your story we need to write something compelling here to make people want to donate and instead of input type text this is going to be is text area because people can write a longer story right here and then we can change the value to form that description the handle change for now can be set to blank and as you can see we get this huge 10 rows by default long story looking great and you can see by default it is all mobile responsive but if we expand it it's also looking great finally below that we can create this banner that says you will get 100 percent of the raised amount so that's going to be below the form field and that's just a simple div that div is going to render an image that's going to be of a source equal to money so if we 
save that, we can see the money bag right there. It's also going to have an alt equal to money. And it's going to have a class name equal to 40 pixels for the width. So w 40 pixels and h 40 pixels as well for the height. Finally, we can set object dash contain. Below that, we're going to have an h4. So we can say h4. And there we can say you will get 100% of the raised amount. Of course, that is dark right now. So let's simply give it a class name. Let's change the font to epilogue. Let's give it a font dash bold to make it a bit more visible. Let's increase the text size all the way to 25 pixels, change it to text dash white, and give it a margin left of 20 pixels. There we go, already looking a bit better. But finally, let's style this div to make it appear like this banner right there. To do that, we can give it a class name, set to w dash full to take a full width, flex. That's going to make them appear in a row, justify dash start to appear at the start, but then items dash center to center it vertically. Then we can give it a p dash four for padding and spacing, bg dash hash 8c 6d fd. This is going to be that purplish color. Finally, let's set the height to be 120 pixels and rounded dash 10 pixels. There we go. This is looking so much better. And now we can continue with our form fields. For this one, we're again going to have two form fields that can appear together in a row. And we already had that at the start. So we can simply copy this div containing two form fields. And we can paste it right here below this div. If we save that, that's great. We get two more inputs, but this time it's going to be goal. And then we can say ETH 0 0.50. That's going to be for our placeholder. And form value must not remain name, rather it's going to be target. And for the last one, it has to be just a bit different. We can change the campaign title to end date. Placeholder can also be end date, but the input type is going to be a date. And the form value is going to be deadline. There we go. So now we have that date picker as well. Finally, the last missing piece of the puzzle is this submit new campaign button. So what we can do is below the form field, we can create a div. That div is going to have a class name, flex, justify dash center, items dash center to center everything both horizontally and vertically, and margin top of 40 pixels. Inside of there, we can really easily use our custom button that we created before by giving it a button type equal to submit button by specifying a title equal to submit new campaign and by giving it styles equal to bg dash hash 1d c 071. And if we save that, we get this great submit new campaign button. If we expand it, we can admire our form in its full glory. There we go. Start a new campaign. Of course, our logic isn't yet hooked up to our actual form layout. So let's focus on that right away. First, we have to keep track of our form values. As you can see right now, we're never actually resetting those form values. So let's create a special function that's going to take all of the values from all of our fields. We can do that by saying const handle form field change. That's going to be a function that takes an event, a key press event. And then based on that, it calls the set form function. First, we need to spread out the entire form. And then we need to change only the special type of the field that changed. So how can we know which field has changed? We can call this either type or we can call it a name of the field. And we can know that if we, of course, pass it to the function. So we can pass it as the first parameter, field name. That is the most descriptive name, field name. And then where is the value stored? The value is stored under e.target.value. This is it. 
this is how you make this function update every single field accordingly. Now, let me show you how to use it. Inside of our field, we can of course call it right here. So we get an event as the first and only parameter, and then we call handle form field changed, and we pass the name of the field as the first parameter, and then the event as the second one. Now bear with me, the name is name here, because that's exactly what we called it inside of the state. We can now copy this and paste it to the second one. But this time, it's not going to be name, it's going to be title. Let's move forward. For the third one, it's going to be description. Moving forward, then we have our form field right here, and that's going to be target. So let's paste it and change this to target. Moving forward, we have the end date, or rather the deadline. So we can copy the form that deadline and make it right here. Finally, there's one more that I missed. If you look at the finished design, there's a campaign image right here. And on our current version, the end date is the last one. So what we can do is we can duplicate our last form field one more time, change the label to campaign image, and then we can say, place image URL of your campaign. There we go. That's going to be input type of URL. And then we're going to change that to form that image and handle change is going to handle form field change under image. There we go. Now we have a full form. It looks like I made one small mistake. These two form fields, the goal and the end date were wrapped in a div and we didn't properly close that div. So I have to move this closing tag right here to properly close them. So we have div, and then we have goal and end date, and div, and then finally we have the form field, and then a div wrapping our button. Now the button is nicely centered, and everything is looking great. Perfect. Now we're also updating our values. But what to do with them? Once all of our values are stored in the state, how can we actually submit it? Well, that happens instantly since our button is of a type submit. So it's going to call the handle submit function. Inside of there, let's first get the event as the first and only parameter. And let's do e.prevent default. This is something you need to do in every single form in React because the default browser behavior is to reload the page after form submission. In React, you never want to do that and this prevents the default behavior. So now, inside of here, let's actually console log the form to see if all of our values are there. Great, I'm going to expand this, open up the inspect element, and then the console. It looks like the form field is not defined. Let me just reload the page. There we go, that's good. And now, I'm gonna enter my name enter the campaign title, for example, building a computer. Story is going to be, I want to build a computer from scratch to be able to record YouTube videos. And then the goal is going to be, let's do something like 0 0.15 ETH. The date is going to be by this Friday. And then the campaign image, you can go to Google and you can right click the image and then copy image address. Then by going back, you can simply paste it right here and we can click submit new campaign. And as you can see, all of the data is right here and it is ready to be submitted. So now we are ready to finally create the functionality to connect our smart contract to our front end side and therefore pass the data to our smart contract. Great. We're going to contain all of our smart contract interactions in one single file. That's the best practice I can give you when working with Web3 applications. All of that is going to be contained inside of our context. So inside of the context folder, create a new index.js file. This is a place where we're going to store all of our Web3 logic. And then we're going to wrap our application with this context so that every single page and component can use it without any problems. This is a centralized source of truth. So let's start with imports. We're going to use import react. 
we're going to need the use context in this file as well as create context. And that is coming from React. Then we're going to import everything we need from third web. So that's going to be use address, use contract, use MetaMask, and use contract write. These are all utility functions coming from at third web dash dev forward slash react. And we can also import ethers coming from ethers. There we go. Then we have to create our context by saying const state context is equal to create context. Finally, we need to create and export our context provider by saying export const state context provider is equal to this is a regular react functional component, but it has children inside of props. So we can get those children. That allows us to wrap our entire application with the context provider, but then still render all of the children that are inside of it. Finally, now is the time to connect with our smart contract, we can say const contract is equal to use contract. And then to that function, we have to provide our contract address. We can do that by coming back to our dashboard and then simply copying the address to clipboard and then pasting it right here. Great. Now there are two different ways to call write functions such as create campaign and donate to campaign. If we go back, I'm going to show you both ways. We can say const mutate async. And then we can rename that to create campaign. That's going to be equal to use contract right to which we pass the contract and then specify the name of our write function. In this case, create campaign. This is going to allow us to simply call this function and create a campaign by passing all of the parameters to it. The other way is just to call the contract that call and then pass everything you need. You can use any one of these methods. With that said, this was the address of the smart contract, but now we also have to get the address of our smart wallet. And that's going to be const address is equal to use address. Also const connect is going to be equal to use MetaMask. With this, we can connect a smart wallet. Great. So now we have everything we need to interact with our smart contract. So what do you say that we start with our first function, which is publish campaign, we can say const publish campaign is equal to an async function that accepts a form back inside of our start a campaign page, we'll send that form that we console logged not that long ago, remember? So we can say const data is equal to await and now we call that create campaign function that we have right here at the top. And we want to pass the entire form to it with some slight adjustments. We're going to call it pass in an array that looks like this. And we have to send it in a certain order. First, we need to send the address from the owner who is creating this campaign. Then we have to send the form that title, which is the title of the campaign, and then so on. But now how do I know in which order do I have to send this? Well, let's go all the way back to our web three side of things, to our contracts, and then right here, let's search create campaign. And there we go. It's the address of the owner first, the title second description, and so on. So in that order, let's continue form that description is the next one form dot target after that, then we're going to have a date, but we have to formulate date a bit by saying new date form dot deadline. And then we can get time. This is going to give us access to a number of seconds past since 9070. This is how JavaScript handles dates. And finally, the last one is form dot image. Great. With this, we are ready to create a new campaign. We can wrap this in a try and catch block to be sure that this worked well. So we can create a try and catch, move this right here to the try. 
And then if it went successfully, we can say Kanza log and say contract call success. And we can Kanza log the data. If it failed, we can duplicate this Kanza log and we can say something like contract call failure and we can Kanza log the error as well. There we go. With this, our first call to the smart contract is done. But as you can see, our publish campaign function we just created is declared, but it's still not used. So how do we pass it all the way here from the context to our create campaign page? Well, our state context provider has to return something, right? So we can say return. It's going to return a state context dot provider. And most importantly, it has to have a value right here. Value is going to be everything that you want to share across all of your components. In this case, we want to share the address of our smart wallet. That's one thing. And then in new lines, we can share everything else that we want to share. We can share the contract itself. But most importantly, we can share the create campaign function. But keep in mind, this create campaign is the name of the contract call. We need to refer to our publish campaign function. So what we can do is simply rename the publish campaign to create campaign in this case. And we're now sharing that across all of our pages. Finally, we have to render the children in between our state context provider. There also has to be a way for us to use, to utilize that context so we can create a custom hook by saying export const use state context is equal to a function that simply calls the use context and then we pass in that state context. Great. Now, of course, this wouldn't work if we don't wrap our entire application with that context. So we can go back to our main.jsx and inside of here, we can import state context provider from dot slash context and we can wrap our application with it. State context provider and make sure that the app is inside of it. There we go. Now it looks like there is an error inside of the index.js that seems to be on line 41. But if you read the error properly, it says fail to parse. If you're using JSX, make sure to name the file.jsx extension. So I'm going to just rename this to index.jsx, save it, reload the page, and Hopefully it works. Let's open up the inspect element and the console. And this time we have the misspelling of the address. There we go. So if I fix this, we should be good. And we are great. So now we're on the home page. If we move to create a campaign, that's great. But now how can we say for sure that we can access this address contract or create campaign function inside of other pages? Well, there's just one way to know, right? Let's go back to pages and create campaign. This is where right now we're just console logging the form, but we need to call a function. So what we can do is we can import the use state context. So import use state context coming from dot dot slash context. Now we can get it right here at the top by saying const create campaign is equal to use state context. And that's it. This is how you share data and functions and all the functionality across all of the pages in your app. You just create one context, a centralized source of truth with calls to smart wallet functionalities, and then you share it across the values through here. We called it create campaign, and therefore we can get it right here. So now inside of here, there's just one thing left to do. We can make this function asynchronous since smart contract calls do take time. And we can say await create campaign and we need to pass some props to it. We are going to first spread the entire form and then we're going to change the target just a bit. Our target is currently in a normal human readable amount. That's going to be 0.5 or similar but we have to change it into way, which is a subunit of ETH. 
we can do that by saying ethers dot utils dot parse units and then we pass the form dot target and say 18 decimals that is how much way one eth is great so now we're passing it in a proper format now there is one more check we want to do before we verify that we can create a campaign we want to ensure that the image that we pass is a valid url image and that's why there's this utility function that simply checks if this image returns a callback. Does it exist? So how to properly this utility function is right here. Let's call it before create campaign by saying check if image to which we can pass the form dot image. And then there's going to be a second parameter, which is a callback function that returns one parameter, which is exists. So if the image exists, we can say if exists, then we can simply do what we have just done. We can await create campaign. Before we do so though, we can start the loading process. So we can say set is loading to true. Later on, we can set the is loading to false after it has finished creating. And then we can navigate to simply forward slash to be able to see it on the dashboard. If the image is not valid, if it doesn't exist, we can simply alert provide valid image URL. And we can also clear the URL by saying set form. We want to spread the entire form, but we want to set the image to an empty string. There we go. So now we can properly create our first campaign. Are you ready? Let's go ahead and give it a shot. I'm going to expand this in its full glory, open up our console just to see how it goes. There we go. And let's start. We're going to do the same thing we did before building a PC. I'm building a cool PC. Let's set the goal to something like 0 0.5. The date can be Friday and then the image URL. I had it already stored in my clipboard and let's click submit new campaign. Immediately we get an error and that's good because the error says that we are not connected to our wallet. Maybe some time has passed and we got disconnected. So that's good because now we can actually check if we are connected or not. I'm going to show you that before we actually hard coded it. So if you go back to our navbar, Let's go right to our components navbar. Take a look at this connect button. It is hard coded. That's one thing. And then also the address, if you look at it, it is hard coded right here. But now that we can use the context, we can actually know if the address is there, if our wallet is connected. So what we can do is we can import. That's going to be use state context coming from dot dot slash context. And then from the context, we can say const get me the connect function and get me the address. And that's equal to use state context. There we go. Of course, we're going to delete our own address. Now let's remove this console to be able to see the button. And now it says connect. Also, I can see that this logo is currently not being used. So I think it should have been used in this small navigation where we can use it right here instead of third web. There we go. So now everything is utilized. And what we want to do is we want to check if we're connected. That is happening right here with the address. And now we have a real connect function. If you go back to context, that's the index.js of the context. You can see that I, I just lied there. I thought that we have the connect function, but we don't have it yet. We're just passing the address and the contract. The connect function, we have declared though, it is right here. So the only thing we have to do is just pass it. Connect. There we go. It's that simple. Now back in the navbar, we can transform this from a regular string to a function call to the connect function. And I think we had it in two places. So let's search for it. There we go. This is the second one. Great. 
So now if we reload the page, it says connect, we can click connect, a new wild MetaMask notification appears, we want to connect, yes. And now it says create a campaign because we are connected. So now we can go to create a campaign, we can repeat the process, building a PC, we can set the goal to 0 0.5, we can set the date, and you can add a campaign image and click submit new campaign. There we go, a MetaMask notification appears, and it says estimated gas, that is fine, let's confirm. And we can even see it right here, pending interaction. But also if we go to dashboard and go under events, I think we should be able to see it here. So once this event is executed, once it is fulfilled, there we go, a contract interaction. We can now go under Explorer and we can immediately see if there is a campaign straight from our dashboard. This is pretty cool. So let's go get campaigns and there we go. It appeared right here, which means that it is actually submitted to the blockchain. Great. Keep in mind, if we weren't using third web, we wouldn't be able to immediately hear using our UI, see that our campaign indeed did get through our smart contract and it got created on the blockchain. Great. Now we are ready to go back and we can close the navbar, close the context, create campaign, and we can go all the way back to our client source app.jsx and we can finally go to our home component because now we have one of those campaigns that we can actually see. Right now, it says just home, but let's go ahead, let's fetch that campaign, and let's showcase it right here on our homepage. Great job so far. Inside of our home, we can import two different hooks. We're gonna use use state, but this time also use effect. And we're gonna, of course, need our context. So we can say import use state context coming from dot dot slash context. When it comes to states in this application, we're gonna use a use state of is loading at the start set to false and also a state of campaigns. So we can say campaigns, set campaigns, and at the start, they're going to be set to an empty array. The reason why we put campaigns in state is because we'll have to fetch them from the smart contract. Then we can get some data from our context by saying address, contract, and get campaigns. If you think about it, this get campaigns function is the function we haven't yet created. In the use state context, if we go in there, we have only created the publish campaign, but not get all campaigns. So let's go ahead and create the get campaigns function as well. Immediately below publish campaign, we can say const get campaigns. That's gonna be equal to an asynchronous function. Inside of there, we can say const campaigns is equal to await contract.call. And then you pass the name of the function inside of the smart contract you want to call, and that's get campaigns. It is that simple to make a call to a smart contract. That's going to give us back our campaigns but we have to parse them a bit to get the meaningful data. So right now, if we console log the campaigns we're gonna get, let's see how they're going to look like. So we can go to the console and reload the page. Of course, after we export this function out of our context, so we can put the get campaigns right here in the value of our context. And then back home, we can have the get campaigns if we properly spell them. And now inside of the use effect, we can call that function. So that's going to be use effect. Of course, it has a callback function and a dependency array. It's going to be recalled once we have the address and the contract. So we have to ensure that the contract is there before we try to make a call. We can do that by saying if contract, then we can call our get campaigns. But our get campaigns is an asynchronous function. If we go into it, we can easily see that. So right here inside of the use state context, we have get campaigns and it is indeed a sync. So what we can do is we can declare a new function, const fetch campaigns, 
is equal to async function. The reason why we did this is because we cannot call an async function immediately inside of the use effect. Rather, to be more precise, we cannot await, and the result of this function needs to be awaited. So instead of calling get campaigns here, we can call it inside of fetch campaigns by saying const data is equal to await get campaigns. And now everything is good. Now, while we're here, we can also set is loading to true before we fetch them. And then after we fetch them, we can say set campaigns is equal to data. And we can also set is loading to false. And now inside of the use effect, we can call the fetch campaigns instead of get campaigns. And now we get back an array, which has nine different elements, amount collected, deadline, image, owner, and a lot of different things. But you can see it also has them in an indexed order, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, what we want to do is we only want to fetch things that matter, that we really need from those campaigns. And we want to format them in a nice human readable format. So in this case, the target is a big number. Also, the deadline is a big number and the amount collected is a big number. We want to transform that into human readable numbers. To do that, we can say const parsed campaigns is equal to campaigns.map where we get an individual campaign right here. And then we're going to instantly return an object. This is how that looks like. So bear with me, the syntax is a bit more complicated. We have campaigns that map inside of which we get one individual campaign. Then we have parentheses, which means immediate return. And then immediately we have an object. That means that we simply want to take one campaign and do something with it. So what we can do is we can say owner is going to be equal to campaign dot owner. Title is going to be equal to campaign dot title. Description is going to be equal to campaign dot description. But now we work with the target and target is going to be equal to ethers dot utils dot format ether. And then we have to pass in the target dot to string. There we go. So now this is going to be in a regular human readable format. We're going to do a similar thing with a deadline. We can simply do deadline dot to number. And again, the same thing goes for the amount collected. So we can say amount collected is equal to ethers dot utils dot format ether. And we can pass in the amount collected dot to string. Finally, the image is going to be set to campaign that image. And we need the PID, the project ID is simply going to be the index of our campaign. So we can use that as a second parameter right here. And now if we console log our parsed campaigns right here, you can see it's going to be a bit more easily understandable. Target is not defined. Let's see, that's going to come from here because that's supposed to be campaign dot target. Same thing right here, campaign dot amount collected dot to string. And the deadline, again, the same thing, campaign dot deadline. If we did that correctly, now we have one object which has the amount collected, 0, 0.0, deadline, which we're going to later on transform to a date, description, image, owner, project ID, target, and title. Everything that we can fully read. Great. The only thing this function has to do with that is simply return it. So instead of console logging it, we can put a return statement. Great. And now inside of the home, our campaigns is fully filled with the data. So we can immediately loop over it and show it. But we have to be smart. If you look at the finished version of the project right here and go to home, you can notice that our home page is really similar to our profile page. Unfortunately, now I have no campaigns here because I deleted my old account, but it is the same thing. Just it's all campaigns versus your campaigns. So we have to be smart and think of this ahead of things. We're going to create a special new component called display campaigns JSX. And we can run RAFCE inside of there. This is going to be the function which we can import from within our home import 
display campaigns from data slash components. And of course, we have to export it from here. So we can simply export it by saying display campaigns. There we go. So now instead of automatically looping over our campaigns inside of the home, we can now render that special display campaigns component as a self closing tag. And we can pass a title called all campaigns. We can also pass the is loading equal to is loading. And finally, we can pass the campaigns themselves campaigns is equal to campaigns. The reason why we did this is because now we'll be able to reuse this component from within our profile page as well. I'm going to show you how simple that will be. Great. With that said, we can dive into the display campaigns component and start creating the layout there. Inside of here, we can import use navigate. As when we click on a specific card, we want to navigate to that specific campaign. So that's coming from react router Dom. We're going to also import the loader component coming from dot dot slash assets. There we go. And that's going to be it for now. We can get all the props that we passed in earlier, such as the title is loading and campaigns themselves. Great. We can initialize our const navigate is equal to use navigate. And we can immediately dive to the layout of our application. We're going to have a div and immediately below that, we're going to have an H1 that's going to render the title. Now, if we save that and go back, you can see that it just says campaigns right here, all campaigns, and we can really see our title. It could be hiding somewhere. So let's apply some class names. Let's give it a class name equal to font dash epilogue. And let's give it a font dash semi bold text dash 18 to make it bigger. And then finally text dash white and text dash left. If we save this, we can see all campaigns, which is exactly our title. Great. Now next to that, we also want to show the number of campaigns. So we can simply render the campaigns dot length. That's it. And we have to spell this properly. So that's going to be campaigns right here. And it says zero. Let's put that inside of parentheses. There we go. All campaigns one. Great. That's looking great. Now below that we can create another div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to flex flex dash wrap margin top 20 pixels and gap dash 26 pixels. Inside of here, we can check if we are loading. So we can say if is loading. And end, then we want to show an image. That image is going to have a source equal to loader. And the alt tag is going to be loader. Of course, we have to apply some class names. In this case, we're going to give it a w 100 pixels, as well as h 100 pixels. Finally, object dash contain. Now, if we save this and reload, we saw that loading for a second. Great. Now we have to check if we maybe have no campaigns and we can do that with another check. If not is loading and campaigns dot length is equal to zero. And meaning in that case, render a P tag. It's going to say you have not created any campaigns yet. There we go. And we can have a class name that's going to say font epilogue. It's also going to be font semi bold text dash 14 pixels leading dash 30 pixels. And finally text dash, we can provide some grayish color such as 818183. If we save this, we should not be able to see that because we indeed do have one campaign. In case you want to test it out, this is how it's going to look like. Great. So now is the time that we loop over our campaigns and show our campaign cards. For that, we need to do one final check. If we are not loading and if campaigns dot length is greater than zero, 
Then we want to say campaigns dot map. And then for each campaign, we want to render a fund card. This is a custom component that we are yet to create. We can provide a key equal to campaign that ID, and we can spread the entire campaign into it. Finally, we can pass the handle click. That's going to be equal to a callback function. That's going to call our special handle navigate function. And to it, we can pass campaign. Now you might be wondering, what is this special handle navigate and not our usual navigate that we use? Well, the handle navigate is a function that we are going to create. So cons handle navigate. And as we said, it takes in a campaign. The reason why we're creating this function is just to increase code readability. Still, we're going to use the regular old navigate. In this case, we want to go to forward slash campaign dash details forward slash and then campaign dot title. But this time we also want to provide a second parameter, which is state. New react router allows you to pass state directly through routing. Isn't that crazy? So we can say campaign is equal to state. And then this data of the campaign we clicked on is going to be passed through state to this campaign details page. Now it looks like our fund card is not created and that's fine. We have to create it. So inside of the components, let's create a new fund card .jsx. Let's run RAFCE and let's export it from our index. There we go. Fund card and inside of display campaigns, we of course have to import it by saying import fund card from dot slash fund card. We can do it like this or straight from components. Either way, it should work. Now it looks like the fund card is not defined, even though we have created it right here, fund card. So if we reload, it still breaks. Now it says campaign is not defined. So if we go back, let's try to search for campaign. And right here, it looks like I misspelled campaign. So let's fix that. There we go and we are good. We have one campaign and we can see one fund card for that campaign. But now of course we want to see something that looks like this. We want to see a beautiful fund card. So to implement just that, we can now control click and we can start developing the fund card layout. Again, we're thinking in terms of reusability here. Once we develop it once, we'll be able to reuse it for all future campaigns. With that said, let's get started with developing our fund card. To get started with our fund card, we can import the tag type, which is one of the assets, as well as third web coming from dot dot slash assets. And we can also import a utility function called days left coming from dot dot slash utils. Now, when we called our fund card, we spread out all of the campaign properties so we can get them right here through props. That's going to be owner, title, description, target, deadline, amount collected, image, and handle click. Now we have everything we need. Now we have to convert the days left from our deadline, which is currently a number. So we can say const remaining days is equal to days left and then we pass the deadline to it. Now for the layout and the beautiful look of our cards. First, we're going to have a wrapper div. This div is going to have a class name equal to on small devices. Width is going to be 288 pixels. Usually width is going to be full. It's going to be rounded dash 15 pixels. And it's going to have a BG of hash 1C, 1C, 2, 4. Finally, once we hover over it, we're going to have a cursor pointer. There we go. Now, if we save this, we cannot see anything yet because the div is empty. And also, this div is going to be clickable. So once we click, we're going to provide the handle click function to navigate to that specific campaign. Now, inside of there, First and foremost, we want to show the image of the campaign. So we can say source is equal to image 
coming from the props. If we save that, we can see our building a PC campaign. Now let's give it a alt equal to fund and let's give it a class name equal to w dash full h dash 158 pixels object dash cover and rounded dash 15 pixels. There we go. This is looking much better. Now below that we can have a div and that div is going to be a wrapper for our content. So we can give it a flex and flex dash call as well as p dash four for padding. Inside of there, we can have one more div. And inside of that div, we're going to have an image that's going to have a source equal to tag type. Now, if we save this, you can see this folder. And also, we can give it a alt tag equal to tag. And we can give it a class name equal to w-17 pixels for the width h-17 pixels for the height and object dash contain. There we go. Now below that, we're going to have a P tag where we're going to have our category. So in this case, we can say category and we can give it a class name equal to margin left of 12 pixels. So divided from the image margin top equal to two pixels like this two divided from the top font dash epilogue. Then we're going to have a font dash medium text dash 12 pixels and then text dash. That's going to be hash eight zero eight one nine one. If we save that, we can see category right here. Now, this is not something that we currently make use of when creating our campaign, but feel free to add the category to the create campaign page and implement it in the smart contract. That's another task for you to do. For now, we can hard code the category to something like education. Let's also give a class name to this div. That's going to be equal to flex, flex dash row to appear in a row, items dash center, and MB dash 18 pixels to divide it a bit from the image. There we go. Now, below this div, we want to have one more div that's going to have a class name equal to block. There we want to have our main title so we can render an H3 tag that's going to render the title and immediately below it, we want to have a P tag that's going to render the description. Now, if we save that, it's going to be barely visible and our description currently technically is the title, but let's apply some class names so we can better see this content. Class name is going to be font dash epilogue. Then we're going to have a font semi bold as well as text dash 16 pixels. That's for the size. Then text dash white text dash left leading dash 26 pixels. And finally truncate. If the title is too long, this is going to shorten it. There we go. Now let's do a similar thing for our description class name. Let's give it a margin top of five pixels to divide it from the title font dash epilogue font dash normal font dash 12 pixels a bit smaller from 16 text dash that's going to be hash eight zero eight one nine one and text dash left leading dash 18 pixel and truncate. If we save that, it's looking great, but maybe you put a bit longer description there. Now it looks like the font normal and font 12 pixels applies the same property. So in this case, we won't even need the font 12. There we go. Great. Finally, now we have to focus on the amount raised and days left. And finally, the creator of that campaign. So that's going to be below this div inside of another div. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex justify between flex wrap margin top of 15 pixels and gap dash two. Now inside of there, we're going to have two different divs because we have two different parts, the raised amount and the days left. 
So let's create one div that's going to have a class name equal to flex and flex dash call because these elements are appearing one below another right here. And before we duplicate it, we can add the content inside of it. So we're going to have an H4 with the amount collected. And below that, we're going to have a P tag that's going to say raised off target. So how much have we raised? Now we can apply class names. So for our H4, the class name is going to be font dash epilogue, font dash semi bold, text dash 14 pixels, text dash, that's going to be hash B2, B3, BD, color, grayish color, and leading dash 22 pixels. There we go, we can see 0, 0.0. Now we can also style the P tag by giving it a class name equal to margin top of three pixels to divide it from the top, font dash epilogue. We're gonna have font dash normal, text dash 12 pixels, leading dash 18 pixels, and text dash that same grayish color of 808191. Of course, put a hash in front. Finally, on small devices, the max dash W is going to be 120 pixels for the width, and we want to truncate it. If we save that, it says 00, 0 raised out of 0 0.5. Great. Now we can take this entire div and duplicate it below. Instead of the amount collected, we want to show the remaining days. And right here, we can say days left. If we now save this, this is looking great. 0, 0.0 raised of 0 0.5, three days left in building a PC card. We're almost done. Now we have to focus on showcasing the owner of this campaign. So that's going to be one div below and our final div. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex items dash center margin top is 20 pixels and cap dash 12 pixels. Inside of there, we wanna have a div that's going to wrap our image. That image is going to render the third web asset. It's going to be of a type user and it's going to have a class name equal to w-1 over two, h-1 over two and object-contain. Now, if we save that, we're going to get this huge image right here. And that's because we haven't yet provided the class names for the wrapper div. So let's go right here and let's provide a class name equal to W 30 pixels for the width, H 30 pixels for the height, rounded dash full, flex, justify dash center, items dash center, bg dash hash 13131a. And if we now save this, you can see that it nicely appears in a circle. Finally, after this image and the div, we can render a p tag. That p tag is going to say by, and then it's going to render a span inside of which we can render the owner address. That span is going to have a class name equal to text dash hash b2 b3 bd so now we can see it but we also have to style the p tag by giving it a class name and saying flex dash one font dash epilogue font dash normal text dash 12 pixels and text dash that's going to be hash 808191 and we can give it truncate property now it fits nicely right here and we have a beautiful campaign card. Great. Now, if we were to add one more campaign card, it would appear right here next to this one, which means that we're utilizing the full power of React. As a matter of fact, we can try creating a new account and then creating another campaign. The only thing you have to do to create a new account is go to MetaMask, click right here, and click create account. Let's call it account two. Now you can go back to account one and you can click send. 
Let's transfer between my accounts and let's send to account two. Let's do 0 0.25 and next and sent. ETH is currently being sent. Let's switch to a second account and let's connect it. The amount of Ethereum should arrive really quickly. And there we go. It's there. Now let's connect our second account and let's create a campaign. Let's do something like JSM. We can take the campaign title from here. Let's call it Save Nature, Save Life. So going back, Save Nature, Save Life. The story we can copy right here. You can type something else. The goal is going to be one ETH and the date is going to be the 1st of January, 2023. Finally, you can go to Google and find an image URL or an image address of a nature image. I'm just going to take this one right here and paste it under campaign. Let's go ahead and click submit. A new MetaMask notification appears. Let's confirm it. And keep in mind, we haven't yet created the loading for this component. We left it static. So we can come back later on and fix that loading. But for now, let's give it a moment and we can track our progress right inside of MetaMask. There we go, pending, we were redirected and we can see two beautiful campaign cards for two different campaigns created by two different users. But now what if we want to know which campaigns did we create? Did this currently logged in account create? Well, for that, we have this profile page, which is currently empty. Now, by using all of the best practices that React offers, thinking about reusability upfront, let me show you how simple it is to create this profile page. You won't believe it. The only thing you have to do is go back to our home page, copy the entire page, go to pages and profile and paste the entire home page, rename the home to profile as the name of the component, as well as the export at the bottom. And you can see that we get the same thing, but now to switch it, let's go back to our context by going to context and then the index.jsx inside of here, we're getting all campaigns, but we only want to get some campaigns. So let's create a new function const get user campaigns which is going to be equal to an async function. We can say const all campaigns is equal to await get all campaigns. Then we can say const filtered campaigns is equal to all campaigns dot filter. There we're going to get a campaign and we can make a check. If campaign dot owner is triple equal to the address of the currently logged in account only then keep it. And finally return filtered campaigns. Now we can share that right here through value. So campaigns, get campaigns, and this is going to be get user campaigns that we want to share. Finally, going back to profile, instead of utilizing get campaigns, we can only call get user campaigns. And with that said, we get one campaign. Wasn't that simple. We can now go back to the dashboard to get all campaigns or click our profile to get only the one we created. You can notice how code reusability makes all the difference. If you like this part of the video, you're going to love what we do on jsmastery.pro. There I teach you a lot of these neat little tricks on applications such as Filmpire, where you build your own Netflix clone or a fully fledged 10 plus hour NFT marketplace where you build your own smart contract from scratch as well. On top of that, if you'd like to really step up your game, we have the JSM Masterclass Pro experience where we help you land the highest possible web development opportunities. With that said, let's go back to our application and let's continue with the development of our great crowdfunding platform. The profile is done. Homepage is done as well. And what is left to do is, of course, if you enter into the campaign, we have to develop the campaign details page. So if we go into campaign details, that's going to be the next thing we have to implement. To get started with our campaign details, let's first import use state 
and use effect from react. We're going to also import use location coming from react dash router dash dom. From the location, we're going to pick up the state that we sent through the routing. Finally, we can import ethers coming from ethers. Now for some local imports, we're going to import the use state context coming from dot dot slash context. We're going to also import our custom button that's going to come from dot dot slash components. We're going to also need some utils, for example, calculate bar percentage coming from dot dot slash utils, and then also days left, which we also saw before. And finally, we're going to need some assets so we can import third web icon coming from dot dot slash assets. There we go. And we are ready to start creating the campaign. Now, let me show you what I meant when I told you that you can transfer state through routing with the new React Router DOM. We can say const the structure, the state is equal to use location. And we call that as a hook. Finally, let's console log the state. Now, if we save that and go back, let me just show you how we're navigating here. If we go to home, remember, we click on a specific campaign, and then we pass the state as the entire campaign. So going back here, now we can console log that state from the location. Let's clear the console, and then let's click on a specific campaign. And there we go, our state is right here, which means that we can now showcase it on our campaign details page. We're going to also need some things from the use state context. So we can say const get donations, which we haven't yet created contract and the address is equal to use state context. Now we're going to also have some component local states. So we can say use state that's going to be is loading and set is loading at the start set to false. We're going to also have the amount we want to donate. So we can say amount set amount and at the start set to an empty string. And finally, we're going to have an array of donators. So we can say use state snippet donators set donators. And at the start, it's going to be set to an empty array. Great. And as the last time we have to parse the days left or the deadline. So we can say const remaining days is equal to days left state dot deadline. And with that, we are ready to look and feel of our campaign details page. First of all, we're going to wrap everything in a div. And then immediately there, we're going to check if we are loading. And then we're going to show a loading dot 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 if we are. Now, if we're not loading, then we can show a div. And that div is going to have a class name equal to w dash full to take the full width of the container flex to be a flex container on medium devices flex dash row, but usually flex dash column margin top 10 to divide it from the nav bar and gap dash 30 pixels inside of there, we're going to have one more smaller div. This div is going to have a class name equal to flex dash one flex dash call. And inside of there, we can showcase our image. That image is going to have a source equal to state dot image. If we save that, we're going to get our huge image right here. We can give it an alt tag equal to campaign. And then we can give it a class name equal to W dash full H dash 410 pixels and object dash cover and rounded dash XL to give it rounded corners. And this is already looking so much better. Now below that image, we want to have one more div. This div is going to have a class name equal to relative. It's going to have a W full H dash five pixels. So only five pixels of height. And it's going to have a background of three, a three, a four, three. Finally, it's going to have a margin top of two. You can see this line right here. That's what we are doing. But now inside of that line, we want to calculate the percentage of the funded amount. So that's pretty cool. We're going to show how much of the entire project has been funded. We can do that by creating a new div 
and giving it a class name equal to absolute age dash full, and then BG, that's going to be hash for a CD 8D. This is a bright green color. Now, if we save that, we won't be able to see it because we haven't yet funded, but later on, we'll be able to check it out. Now we have to make this dynamic. So to this div, we're going to also give a style property. There we can specify the width of that style and we're gonna make that a template string. There we're gonna call our calculate bar percentage. That's going to be a function to which we can pass the state.target and then state.amount collected. And at the end, we can put the percentage sign right here. Finally, we're gonna also give it a max width of 100%. Great. Now, let me show you how this calculate bar percentage works behind the scenes. It just takes the goal and the raised amount, and then it calculates the percentage. Great. So now we have that percentage bar and we have our image. We can go below this div right here and below one more div. So only have two divs left right there. And there we can start by creating these count boxes. You see those three boxes right here. So let's create a div that's going to wrap them by giving it a class name equal to flex on medium devices width is 150 pixels. W is full usually flex dash wrap justify dash between and gap dash 30 pixels. Inside of there, we want to render a new component called count box, a self-closing component to which we can pass a title. The first one is days left, and then the value, which is going to be remaining days. Finally, we can duplicate this both for the raised amount and total backers. So right here, we can pass a dynamic title that's going to be raised off state.target and then how much was raised, we can pass it through the value that's going to be state.amount collected. And for the last one, we have to provide the total number of backers, so total backers, and there we can get the donators.length. Great. Now, if we save this, we're gonna get an error, and that's because we haven't yet created this component. So going back to components and creating a new count box.jsx, running RAFCE and then exporting it from the index is going to fix that error. So that was count box. And now back inside of campaign details, we can import count box from our components. And there we go. You can see three different count boxes here, but now is the time that we dive into it and we develop its look and feel. There through props, we're getting the title and the value as you know, because we sent them a second ago. And then we're gonna have a wrapper div. That div is going to have a class name equal to flex, flex dash call, items dash center, and w dash 150 pixels. If we save that, nothing is going to happen because our div is empty. So let's give it an H4 that's going to render the value. And let's also give it a P tag that's going to render the title. So now if we save this, you can see days left, raised off, and total backers. Finally, let's apply some class names to both of these properties. For the H4, let's give it a font-epilogue. Let's give it a font-bold. Text-30 pixels to make it a bit larger. Text-white. Padding-3 to give some spacing. BG-hash 1C1C24 rounded dash T for top 10 pixels, W dash full, text dash center, and truncate. If we save that, this is looking great. Now let's do a similar thing for the P tag by giving it a class name of font epilogue, font dash normal, text dash 16 pixels, text dash hash 8081, 91 bg dash hash 28282e padding x meaning only horizontal of three 
and then padding y, meaning only vertical, of 2, w dash full for full width, rounded dash b, meaning on bottom, then pixels, and then text dash center. If we now save this, we can see our beautiful cards. Great, this is starting to look more like the campaign details page that we want to. Finally, we of course have to do all of this part, the creator, the story, donators, and most importantly, the ability to fund. So let's go from top to bottom. We can go back to campaign details and go below this div right here. Actually, we're going to go below one more div, so we only have one left. That's because we want to move outside of this entire rectangle right here and want to go down. That means that we can create a new wrapper div for the rest of the content. That's going to have a class name of MT60 pixels to divide it from the top. Flex. On large devices, flex dash row, usually flex dash column, and gap dash five. Inside of there, we want to have one more smaller wrapper div that's going to have a class name equal to flex dash two, like this. Flex, flex dash call, and gap dash 40 pixels. Finally, inside of there, we want to have one empty div. And after that div, put some spaces right here because we'll have to add another empty div later on. So first, we're starting with the creator. We can look at the reference design and creator is right here. This is looking really close to our number right here. So we can copy the class names from our count box for the H4. Let's copy the entire H4 actually and let's paste it right here within the div. Now, we're not gonna show the value, rather we're simply going to hard code creator. Now, if we go back, you can see creator right here, but we're gonna modify the styles just slightly. Instead of bold, it's going to be semi-bold. Instead of 30 pixels, it's going to be 18 pixels of size. It's going to be text dash white, and we don't need any other properties that we have here, Rather, we only need uppercase. There we go, so let's save it. And this is looking great. Now, below that creator, we want to create a div for this little portion where we have an image, an address, and the number of campaigns. So immediately below the H4, create a div. That div is going to have a class name of margin top of 20 pixels, flex, flex-row, items-center, flex dash wrap and gap dash 14 pixels. Inside of there, we want to have one more div that's going to be the div for the image. So we can say class name is equal to w dash 52 pixels, h dash 52 pixels, flex items dash center, justify dash center, rounded dash full, and then we can give it a bg hash 2c 2f32 and a cursor dash pointer. Finally, inside of there, we can render a self closing image tag that's going to have a source of third web. We can say alt of user and we can give it a class name equal to w 60%, h 60%, and object dash contain. If we save that, we have our image right here. Now below this div containing our image, we can have a simple div that's going to contain our stats. So we can say h4, that's going to render the state.owner, which is the address. And then below that, what we can do is we can hard code the number of campaigns. So we can say 10 and then campaigns. There we go. So you can see everything right here. Now let's apply some styles to our H4. Class name, font dash epilogue, font dash semi bold, text dash 14 pixels, text dash white, and break dash all. This is going to apply a word break property. There we go. Below that, we can style the speed tag by giving it a class name of margin top of four pixels, font dash epilogue, font dash normal, text dash 12 pixels, and text dash hash 
8081891. And now if we save that, this is looking great. Finally, we can duplicate this entire div containing the creator and everything inside of there because we want to show the next section. And it's also going to have the story, which is the same as the creator, and the donators is also going to be similar. So we can start by duplicating this section. That's just this empty div where the creator is on the top and the three divs at the end. Let's paste it. In this case, we won't need anything that is below the H4. So we can simply delete that part right here and just keep the H4, but we're going to rename that to story. Finally, below, we're going to have a div that's going to have a class name equal to MT-20 pixels. And there, we simply want to render a P tag. And this P tag is going to be the same as these campaigns right here. So let's simply paste the campaigns, change it to state dot description. But rather, we're going to just increase the font size a bit to 16 pixels. We also want to give it a leading dash 26 pixels to make the text appear a bit larger and text dash justify. If we save that, we can see our building a PC right here. But as you can see, it appears that the story is not in line with our building a PC, whereas here it is. So let's see why that is the case. First of all, on the description, we don't need this margin top right here. We just need font epilogue, font normal, text 16. We need a color, leading, and text justify. And that is inside of this div with a margin top. So everything here is looking good. But here's the catch. This H4 doesn't need a P3. That's what moves it around. So if we fix this, you can see now it's looking great. And actually, the above one right here, which is this H4, doesn't need the padding of three either. So if we fix that, now everything is aligned. Now we have a story, although this description is quite short, sometimes you can put bigger descriptions such as this one. Now let's move on to the donators. And again, that's going to be really similar. So we can copy this div entirely, change the story to donators. And now in here, we're going to have some dynamic logic. So let's keep this P tag for later on. But for now, let's give this div some more properties such as flex, flex dash call and gap dash four. Inside of here, we want to check if there are any donators by checking if donators dot length is greater than zero. If it is, then we want to say donators dot map and then get each individual item or a donator and also an index. For each one of these, we want to return a div. So right here, we can say div and there we can say donator. This is simply static for now. But if there aren't any donators, in that case, we can say or render and we simply want to render a P tag that's going to look like this. Instead of state the description, we can say no donators yet be the first one. And we can save that. There we go. Donators, no donators yet be the first one, same as on the design. But later on, once we get some donators, we can render them out right here. For now, we can move to the last part of the page, which is the fund card. Through this input and this button, we'll be able to fund the campaign. So to get started, let's go below one, two, and then three divs. So keep in mind, you have to exit three divs. That's going to be one, two, three, and then down. Inside of here, we can start creating that layout. So we can say class name is equal to flex dash one. And then we can give it another title, which we can copy from the top H4 donators, paste it here. And this is going to say fund. If we save it, that's looking good. But now let's focus on creating this entire card. To do that below this H4, we can create a wrapper or a container div and give it a class name equal to MT 20 pixels for margin top. 
it's going to be flex and flex dash column since elements are going to appear in a column. We're going to give it a padding of four and a BG of hash 1C, 1C, 2, 4 and rounded dash 10 pixels. If you do that, you should be able to see this rectangle appear at the bottom. Finally, inside of there, we can render a P tag that's going to have a class name equal to font dash epilogue. It's going to have a font dash medium, text dash 20 pixels to make it a bit larger, leading dash 30 pixels, text dash center, and the text color is going to be text dash hash 808191. Inside of there, we can say fund the campaign. There we go. This is looking good. And below this P tag, we can render a div. That div is going to have a class name equal to MT-30 pixels. And we can render our one and only input. That input is going to have a type is equal to number. We can set the placeholder to something like ETH 0.1 so that people know that they can type ETH amounts there. We can set the step to be only 0.01 since we're working with Ethereum amounts, not dollars or cents. And we can give it a class name equal to W full padding Y of 10 pixels. And let's save it. There we go. This is how it's looking right now. But if we give it on small devices, padding X is 20 pixels. And usually padding X is 15 pixels. We can also remove that outline by saying outline none and give it a border by saying border one pixel and border dash, we can give it a color of 3A, 3A, 43. Most importantly, we can set the BG to transparent. We can set the font to epilogue. We can set the text to white and this already looks much different, much closer to our finished product. Let's also give it a text dash 18 pixels to make it a bit larger and leading dash 30 pixels. Finally, let's set the placeholder color by saying placeholder colon text is hash 4B5264 and rounded dash 10 pixels. And there we go. Our input is done. Now we can also specify the value to be equal to amount and the on change is going to be a simple callback function that's going to take in an event, a key press event, and it's going to set the amount to e.target.value. And there we go. Now we can set the amount of ETH. Now let's create this little banner right here. Back it because you believe in it. Support the project for no reward just because it speaks to you. And then the fund campaign button. Just below this input, we can create that div by giving it a class name equal to MT-20 pixels to divide it from the input. Then we can give it a padding of four, a BG of 13131A, and a rounded of 10 pixels. There we go. Now inside of there, we can render an H4, and that H4 is going to simply say back it because you believe in it. There we go. And below that, we can render a P tag that's going to say support the project for no reward, just because it speaks to you. There we go. Of course, this is not going to look good right now because it's dark on dark. So let's give it a class name to this H4 font dash epilogue font dash semi bold text dash 14 pixels leading dash 22 pixels text dash white and save it looking good. Now for the P tag, let's give it a class name equal to margin top of 20 pixels font dash epilogue font dash normal. Let's go back a bit leading dash 22 pixels and text dash that's going to be hash 808191. There we go. This is looking great. Finally, we can render our custom button below it. So just one more div below, we can create a custom button component. 
let's give it a button type, btn type equal to button. Title is going to be fund campaign. Styles is going to be w dash full and bg dash hash 8c 6d fd. That is that purplish color. And we can give it a handle click equal to handle donate. This is the function that we are yet to create. So right here, we can create const handle donate. That's going to be an asynchronous function. Because there we're going to make a contract call and contract calls do take some time. So as you can see, our complete campaign page is now designed. We just haven't yet created the donators part. And that's because we cannot yet even donate. I also noticed that we are missing some space between the button and this div. So instead of margin top on this div, let's put margin Y meaning top and bottom. There we go. So now let's expand this. And would you look at that? This is looking like a great campaign page. They want to get 0.5 to build a PC and they have three days left. So what do you say? Let's help them, right? In this case, to help them, we have to make the fund functionality work. So to do that, what do you think? To which file do we have to go? Well, we have to go back to our context and then our index.jsx. Inside of here, below get users campaign, we can create our new function that's going to tap into creating and getting donations. Right inside of here, let's create a new function called donate. It's going to be an asynchronous function that's going to accept a PID, a project ID, and the amount that we want to donate. There, we can say cons data is equal to await contract that call. And our function is called donate to campaign. And it accepts three parameters, the PID, the address, and the amount. Finally, we can simply return the data. This is a function right on our smart contract. And we can verify that if we go to our dashboard and see donate to campaign, which accepts a project ID and a token value. Great. With that said, we can now pass this donate function all over our context right here. Now, what we can also do while we're here is we can get all donations. So let's create a new function const get donations is equal to an async function that accepts a PID as the first and only parameter. There we can say cons donations is equal to await contract dot call get donators. And we need to pass the PID. Now inside of here, we have to get the number of donations by saying const number of donations is equal to donations zero dot length. These are all the donations on a specific project. Now we can parse those donations by saying const parse donations is an empty array. And then we can create a for loop, we can say for let i is equal to zero, i is lower than of number of donations, i plus plus. And then we simply want to push to parse donations parsed donations dot push, we want to push in an object that has the donator inside of it, that's going to be equal to donations zero and then I, and then the actual donation amount, which is going to be ethers dot utils dot format ether. And then we pass donations one, and then I, and that's going to be dot to string before the ending of the parenthesis. There we go. So now we have what we need the donator and the donation for each donation. So we can simply return the parsed donations. There we go. And we can pass the donations right here, get donations. Great. With that said, we can go back to our pages, campaign details. And now we can make that donation. So scrolling up, let's now handle the donate function. The only thing we have to do here is first of all, the set is loading to be equal to true at the start. And then after we initialize the loading, 
we can get the donate function from our use state context. And then we can simply call it right here by calling await donate. And that's going to be it. But we have to ensure that we're calling it properly and that we're passing the PID that is going to be the state.pid to it. And finally, then we can set the is loading to false after we successfully donate. Now, if we look into that, if we go to the donate function and go right here to the use state context, we can see that we are passing the PID, but we're not passing the amount. So right here, we also have to pass the actual amount that we want to donate as the second parameter. Then we can do await contract.call, where we pass the name of the function on the smart contract we want to call, the PID. And finally, we don't have to pass the address, just the amount, but it has to be parsed in a different way. It's going to be parsed as a value inside of an object where ethers.utils dot parse ether, and then we pass in the amount. So we have to first parse it to be able to send it over. Great. With that said, we can now go back to campaign details and our donate function is ready. Now, of course, we won't be able to see those donations if we don't fetch them as well. So above, let's create a const fetch donators async function. And this function is simply going to say const data is equal to await get donations to which we can pass state.pid. And then we can set donators to be equal to data. Now, this function is not being called right now. And when do we want to call it? Well, we want to call it as soon as our campaign details page loads. So we can use the use effect, have a callback function. And then in the dependency array, we can put the contract and the address. We have to ensure that the contract exists. So we can say if contract only then call fetch donators. And there we go. The donators are set. And then we're going to have access to them right here inside of donators. So that's great. Let's try to make a payment. If we go back to our app, we have an error. So going back and opening the console, we can see address is not defined. Let's see where that is. That is right here. I am missing a second S. And if we save that, come back, everything looks good. Some time has passed, so I got disconnected. I'm going to connect again. That's great. And now let's fund. I'll donate 0 0.05 and click fund. A new MetaMask notification appears and you can see 0 0.05 plus some gas fees and I can click confirm. Now our loading still isn't properly working. It's just a simple loading screen. Later on, we're going to implement an overlay. But for now, we can see that the transaction is pending. And hopefully, there we go, it went through. So now if we go back to our dashboard, we can see that we raised 0 0.05 out of 0 0.5. We can see that we have total backers zero, which doesn't look good. So let's go back, reload the page, and then click again. Yep, it still says zero, but the amount seems to be all right. And in here, we can see donators of zero. That doesn't seem to be good. So what we can do is we can console log the donators right here, or rather just the data. Now we can inspect, go to console, and it looks like get donations is not a function. I misspelled it. That was supposed to be get donations. There we go. If we now fix that and reload the page, it says that contract that all is not a function. Let's see where that is happening. That is most likely happening in the context where we were supposed to type contract dot call, not all. If we now fix this and go to inspect element, now it says invalid big number string value, value 0 0.x. Interesting. So we're trying to parse some numbers. It could be the number for the backer, as that is the only thing that's not showing up here. So let's see what's happening with our number of backers. 
that is right here. This should be working, donators.length. So are we also cons logging the donors? We are right here, okay. And, but we didn't see this console log appear in the console. So the error happens even before, invalid big number. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of information on where this is hiding. Invalid big number doesn't really say a lot. So let's try to debug it. If we comment out this fetch donators functionality, what is going to happen? Now, as you can see, there is no that error. So if we bring this back, and if we bring this back, it's going to get back there. There we go. So we know that the error is most likely somewhere inside of the get donations function. So let's go into the state context and get donations. And inside of here, I missed the function call of the two string method. So if we fix that, that should work. And there we go. Total backers is one and we can see our donator and a donation. So now these three cards are working perfectly, but we are yet to display our donators right here in the list. So now that we have the data, we can go all the way down to donators and we can show something. And by something, I mean have a div where each div has a key. That key is equal to item.donator. And then we can also say slash and pass the index to be unique. We can give it a class name equal to flex justify dash between items dash center and gap dash four. Now inside of there, we're going to have two different P P tags. The first paragraph is going to render the index plus one, which is the number of the donation dot, and then the item dot donator. This is the actual address. Finally, let's give it some class names so we can see it. That's going to be font dash epilogue. It's going to be font dash normal text dash 16 pixels text dash. That's going to be hash B2 B3 BD and leading dash 26 pixels as well as break dash all. Now, if we save that, we unfortunately still cannot see it. And that's because we misspelled the length right here. At least I did. So make sure that it is donators dot length, and you'll be able to see it right here. Now we can duplicate this P tag. And instead of rendering the index and the donator, we simply want to render the item dot donation. There we go, you can see it on the right side right here. We can also change the color of the second tag just a bit by saying 8081. Nine, one. So there we go. Now we have the amount and donators. And with that said, our campaign details is now completed. This was a long component with a lot of functionality, but now we're finally able to donate and view donations, but we can also view the entire campaign. So right here, we can go back. We can see that we have raised 0.05 out of 0.5, three days left by who created this campaign. And then we can see all information right here alongside the donators. And now we're certain that the fund campaign card works because we can actually see our donation. And not only that, the amount that we sent, which was 0.05 was actually transferred to our account one. Isn't that great? Perfect. With that said, we can collapse it one more time. And what we can do next is implement the loading states. Remember, while we're submitting the funding or while we're creating a new campaign, nothing really happens. There's no loading. But now we're going to implement a custom loading state, or rather a custom loading overlay, should I say, that's going to appear across our entire application while the interaction with the blockchain is happening. So what we can do is go to components and create a new loader.jsx component. There you can run RAFCE and let's immediately export it just so we don't forget that's going to be loader. Now we can go into the loader component and implement this simple loading overlay. To start implementing our loader, the only thing we have to do is import the loader coming from dot dot slash assets. And now we can create one wrapper for our entire screen 
that's going to have a class name equal to fixed instead of zero, Z of 10, meaning it's going to show on top of our content and it's going to take the full height. So we can say H dash screen. We can give it a background, but it's going to be an RGBA 0, 0, 0, which is black, and then 0 0.7 for the opacity. Finally, it's going to be flex items dash center and justify dash center so that everything appears in the center and flex dash call. Inside of there, we can render an image. That image is going to have a source equal to loader. The alt tag is going to be set to loader as well. And it's going to have a class name equal to w-100 pixels, h-100 pixels, and object-contain. Finally, the only thing we have to do is add a p tag that's going to have a class name equal to mt-20 pixels, font-epilog, font-bold, text-20 pixels, and text-center. Inside of there, we can say transaction is in progress. We can put a break tag then, and then say, please wait, dot, dot, dot. Great. Now we can go back to wherever we typed loading. Let's see. We can toggle on this match case, and it looks like we're using loading right here in display campaigns. We're also using it right here in campaign. Let's see, there we go loading, but let's turn on this match whole word. And then we can see where we really need to implement that loading. So first of all, it's going to be in campaign details. So right here, instead of loading dot dot dot, we can import the loader component. And now we can render it. The only thing we have to do is just put the self closing loader component right here. That same loader component is also going to go in one more place. And that is when we create a campaign. So you can go to create campaign. And right here, you can see we typed loader. So in this file as well, we have to import the loader and then render it right here as a self closing component. Great. Now to test it out, we can create one more campaign. So we can go to create a campaign. I'm going to type Adrian, let's do something from here, maybe building hope village. So we can copy the title building hope village, we can add a story, you can type something in the description, the goal can be one ETH. The date is going to be let's do something like this. And then for campaign title, you can get this from Google, I'm just going to copy the address from here, paste it and click submit new campaign. As you can see, we have our loading, but it doesn't look that good. We missed the white color. So while we have the chance, let's go back to loader. And right here, we have to say text dash white. And there we go, transaction in progress. It also looks that the flex dot call is not applied properly. It looks like I typed flex flex. This was supposed to be flex dash call. And there we go transaction in progress. And now we know now our user knows that they have to make an interaction with MetaMask. As soon as we confirm it, you can see transaction is still in progress. That's because transactions on the blockchain do take some time. But as soon as it is finalized, the loading is going to stop and will be redirected back to the homepage. And there we go. That works perfectly. Now, finally, let's see if it's going to work for the donate functionality as well. So let's go to save nature, save life. And let's also make sure that we redirect once we fund the campaign. So I'm going to search for fund campaign. There we go. And there on handle donate, we want to navigate to the homepage. So let's see if we have imported the navigate right here. We haven't. So we can do use navigate. We can initialize it here. Const navigate is equal to use navigate. And finally, right here, we can navigate to forward slash. There we go. Perfect. So let's try to donate 0 0.02. Click fund. 
transaction is in progress, which is perfect, and we can now confirm. As you can see, we're waiting for the confirmation to happen, and immediately after it is done, we'll be redirected back to the dashboard. And there we go. We might need to reload the page one more time. Now you can go into Save Nature and we can see that we have one backer 0.02. Perfect. With that said, our dashboard page is done. Our profile page is done as well. Our create a campaign page is done. And all of this is entirely mobile responsive. As you can see, it feels like a native mobile application. Perfect. It has been phenomenal having you with me throughout this entire video. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for improving your own web development knowledge with new technologies such as Web3. Now that we're almost at the end of this video, I hope that you now share my enthusiasm for a huge impact the third web has on the Web3 community. With that said, there's just one thing left to do, and that is deployment. To deploy our great project, we're going to use a simple React deployment tool called Netlify. We can start by signing up or logging in at top right. Once you're in, you can go to Sites. And now you can scroll down and we can drag and drop our build folder right here. Back in our code, you can close all of the currently open files, collapse it, open up your terminal, stop it from running by pressing Control C and then Y, and then you can run npm run build. This is going to create an optimized production build of your great application. And there we go. If you now go to File Explorer, Client, you'll see a new dist folder. Right-click it and then click Reveal in File Explorer or Open in Finder. You can open it on top of your browser and then simply drag and drop the entire dist folder right here. This is going to upload and deploy your application to the internet in just a couple of seconds. There we go. Our production build is now published and the website is deployed under this Mary Sable random URL. If you want to use this application to put it in your portfolio with a custom URL, or you want to have a real email connected to it and faster speeds as well, I would highly recommend to check out Hostinger's hosting. I personally use them for all of my major projects. The link is going to be down in the description. But with that said, let's click this link right here and check out our great project. All of our campaigns are immediately right here and we can now again connect to our application, but this time not connecting to localhost, but rather to our real published URL. There we go. And regarding the blockchain side, we didn't have to do absolutely anything because we're still utilizing the same smart contract published on ThirdWeb. Perfect. With that said, huge thanks to ThirdWeb, not only for sponsoring this video, but for creating such an amazing software that is a huge game changer in the whole Web3 industry. And if you like building this project, you're going to love building NFT Marketplace. It is a 12 hour course where you're going to build a Solidity smart contract, use Next.js and harness the full power of the blockchain. By watching this video down in the description, you're getting a special YouTube discount code. So feel free to check it right away. If you're watching this video at the time of the release, we are soon starting with another cohort of the JSM Masterclass experience. If you're learning a lot through these pre-recorded videos on YouTube, imagine how much can you learn if myself and other team of developers guides you and mentors you every step of the way. If that's something you would be interested in, make sure to go to jsmastery.pro and click the take the quiz button to see if you're eligible. With that said, thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day.